On a typical day, Park Suho was out for a walk and contemplating what present to buy for his brother. Suddenly, an object fell from the sky and caused an explosion, causing widespread panic in the area. As he tried to flee, multiple beams of light descended upon the city, destroying buildings and injuring many people. Suho ran in the opposite direction, narrowly avoiding being hit by a truck. However, a mysterious portal suddenly opened and sucked him in. Upon waking up, Park Suho found himself in a forest, with two moons and flying creatures in the sky. He was shocked and confused by the strange surroundings. Suddenly, he witnessed a giant bear being killed by a pack of wolves. He tells his story, while the doctor listens to him and asked him how did he come back alive from there. He hid behind some rocks, but noticed a wolf pup behind him. He continued to run, but a message appeared, indicating that his constitution had increased by one. He tripped and fell off a mountain while still trying to comprehend the message. He saw some fruits and attempted to eat them, but then noticed eyes in the grass and froze. A giant snake lunged at him but was attacked by a large frog before it could reach him. After this, Park Suho lost consciousness. On the 67th day of being stranded, he was sitting high up in the trees trying to evade the wolves that were waiting for him below, and he was looking for a safer place to stay. After being stranded for one year, he was picking a giant banana, and as he ate it, he noticed a wolf pup that had been following him. Suddenly, a giant gorilla attacked him from above. He managed to dodge the attack, but the gorilla fell from the tree, and unfortunately, the pup was injured in the fall. The gorilla then turned its attention to the pup, Suho jumped on the gorilla's head and stabbed it in the eyes. The gorilla threw him off, injuring him severely. He reflected on his actions and realized that they were impulsive and reckless. The doctor questioned him about his behavior, and he explained that he couldn't always avoid territorial conflicts, as it wouldn't solve anything. He acknowledged that there is a leader or ruler in every situation, and that he couldn't avoid conflict forever. The gorilla charged at him, but the wolves came to his defense and attacked the gorilla. Suo lost consciousness, thinking he was going to die, but the wolves didn't harm him. He surmised that the wolves must have thought that he had saved the pup. It turned out that the pup was the son of the wolf king, the leader of the Crimson Wolves. In the second year of being stranded, the wolves had accepted him into their pack. As 31st year passed, he was fighting giant snakes with the wolves, and he still hasn't seen any signs of civilization. He considered the wolves as family, as they fight for territory and survival together. After 120 years of being stranded, Park Suho believed that he was the only human on the planet. He had been constantly fighting for survival and had made and lost friends over time. He had lost track of how much time had passed. The doctor asked him how he was able to return to Earth. He explained that during a war with the gorilla race, a portal opened. Meanwhile, a group of people were investigating an area as their equipment had malfunctioned when suddenly a red portal opened. They panicked and ran away, not knowing what was coming out of it. The two people were terrified, but the woman among them was already preparing for a fight and ordered them to flee. She was ready to attack whatever emerged from the portal, but when she saw a man coming out of it, she froze upon seeing his eyes. The man shouted as he emerged. As Park Suho emerged from the portal, he fell unconscious. The group was confused, and the woman among them wondered what pressure she had felt. She realized that she had never experienced anything like it, even when fighting monsters in high-tier dungeons. The group reported the incident as a returner coming back and called for an ambulance. The doctor finished the interview with Suho and thanked him for his story. The doctor informed Suho that his story will be shared with the Awakener Bureau and he will be discharged in a few days. Suho thanked the doctor for listening as it was his first conversation with another human in a thousand years. The doctor replied that they should be thanking him as he shared a valuable story with them. The doctor found Suho's story to be quite interesting. At the Awakener Bureau, the woman questioned whether the information on Suho was accurate, as he was ranked as an F, equivalent to an average person. She was curious as to how Suho went through the portal, and was still unsure if he truly was an F rank. The man speculated that perhaps Suho had simply gotten lucky and come across a return stone. They received the report from the doctor and passed it on to the woman. The report indicated that Suho had PTSD, which was common among returners, and that he behaved like a wolf. The woman volunteered to personally deliver the documents to Suho as she wanted to verify something. At the hospital, Suho realized that two weeks had passed since he returned and everything felt unfamiliar. He wasn't sure what to do. A nurse came in and gave him his meal. A woman named Choi Suyoung from the Awakener Bureau entered the room and saw Suho eating like an animal. 
She introduced herself and mentioned that she was the first person he saw when he returned. Young initially thought Suho looked like a predator when he came out of the portal, but now she thought she must have been mistaken. Suho asked Choi Young about the Awakener Bureau. She explained that it's a government organization that helps returners adjust to society and gave him a list to sign. He was surprised when he saw a pen and smelled it, but she scolded him for drawing on the paper. She thought he was an idiot. She asked him what he had learned during his time away, like magic or martial arts, but he told her that he had just lived in a forest. She sighed as she thought he had just spent all 10 years running to survive. She believed that for a true returner, they needed to kill monsters and steal their energy. She thought Suho had just gotten lucky by finding a return stone in a peaceful dimension. Suho clarified that it wasn't 10 years, but rather that he had been in the jungle for 1,000 years. Suyoung was annoyed and told him that he went in 2015 and returned in 2025. Suho was shocked by this information. She gave him his Awakener's card and told him that his bill would be paid and to read his documents. She also instructed him to return to his family after he had recovered and then left. He was shocked when he saw his family are still alive. Suho accepted that all of his friends and family had already passed away after a thousand years had passed and that upon his return to Earth, he had also lost the forest family he spent a thousand years with. Suho discovered that his parents had died the same day he entered the portal, but his brother Junho was still alive. He immediately asked the doctor to help him leave the hospital because of this. The doctor rejected his request, but Suho insisted that he wasn't asking for permission. The doctor agreed to help, but only on one condition. The doctor arranged for a taxi to take Suho and gave the driver instructions. The nurse asked the doctor why he was helping Suho, and the doctor replied that he wanted to hear more of Suho's story and also wanted someone to fix the door handle that was mangled. The nurse was confused about how the handle had been damaged. The doctor realized that it had been a while since he had met an irregular person like Suho. Suho saw a broadcast of two Awakeners fighting on television, the driver exclaimed that if he were an Awakener, he would quit and make money hunting in the fields. Suho asked about the hunting grounds in Seoul. The driver explained that 10 years ago, doors to other worlds opened around the world, it was called, the day of the great disaster. On a fateful day, Earth became connected to numerous other realms and was overrun by monstrous creatures, resulting in a loss of 10% of the global population. The military was unable to effectively combat the invaders. People who disappeared during the disasters are called Awakeners, they were given mercenary licenses, giving them permission to hunt monsters. The Awakeners formed guilds and make money by hunting fields or dungeons. Suho inquired about becoming a mercenary, to which the driver responded that he would have to first awaken and then pass the mercenary examination at the Awakener Bureau. Suho found the process to be too complex. Upon arriving at the designated location, as indicated by the driver, Suho made his way to the building. An elderly woman questioned him about his identity, to which he replied that he was searching for someone named Junho. The woman informed him that no one by that name resided there and chased him away. He later learned that they had mistaken him for a loan shark and that his brother was heavily in debt. Suho observed the numerous letters demanding payment and walked away, reflecting on how in harsh wild environments, strength is the law, while in civilized society, money holds power. Suho attempted to submit a mercenary application, but was denied due to not meeting the necessary qualifications. The staff informed him that he was lacking four Awakener points as an F rank. They suggested he attend an Awakener school or earn points through field experience and reapply later after awakening. Suho came across an advertisement for a goblin field in Suwon and headed there. Upon approaching the gate, the guards asked for his purpose, he responded that he was there to hunt. The guards then asked for his mercenary license, but Suho did not have one and was told that civilians are not permitted in the field. Suddenly, a car came out of nowhere and crashed because a goblin was attacking the passengers. The guards responded quickly and surrounded the vehicle. The goblin came out and the guards fired, killing it. They searched for Suho, but thought he got scared and ran away. Suho entered the hunting ground and felt a sense of familiarity. He observed the area and wondered if all cities other than Seoul had been turned into ruins. As darkness arrived, he decided it was time to hunt. He felt that his body was a bit heavy as he jumped, ran, and climbed buildings, he thought it was an effect of returning, and that he was weaker now. Suho stood on top of a building and surveyed his surroundings, he found a group of goblins surrounding a wounded white dog. The goblins were about to attack, so Suho intervened and stopped them. He smashed the first goblin's head, and multiple error messages appeared. 
He was confused seeing the messages as he swiped them away. The other goblins attacked at the same time, but he easily defeated them. One goblin tried to run away, but Suho grabbed and threw it on the floor. A critical error message appeared. Then remembered that 100 years ago his body was trained to the limit and he barely got any stat increase alert. He wondered if the error was the reason his abilities weakened. A message appeared that he had gained access to the achievement shop. He thought if this was because he had awakened. Suho looked at his points and saw that he only had seven points and could only buy bread and water. He saw the white dog lying there wounded and dying beside her pup. He approached it and understood that it was trying to tell him to take care of its pup. He gave the pup some food. He counted the goblins he killed and found that he got seven. He thought that he really needed a car. He buried the dog and when morning came, he decided it was time to leave. People were busy at the entrance, but they were shocked when they saw Suho carrying the goblins he had killed. The guard was shocked as he recognized Suho from earlier. At the office, the staff was tallying Suho's kills and heard about the blood crystals. She explained that they came from one of the goblins and their prices depend on the amount of energy stored in the crystal. She gave him cash, as he doesn't have a payout account registered, and advised him to get registered. Suho thought that it would be easy to make money once he becomes a mercenary and enters a dungeon. Meanwhile, Junho was on his way home when a group of thugs attacked him. It was the debt collectors who beat him as he paid the monthly payment. The thug counted the money but told him it wasn't enough. The guy hit him again when he said he would pay them in three days. Suddenly, Suho came looking furious as he approached the surprised Junho. Junho remembered a past incident where he was being bullied in school and had reached out to his brother, Suho, for help, but Suho had ignored him and walked away, believing that his brother would not be of much help to him. On the day of a disaster, Junho's aunt and uncle came to take him away, as they were unable to contact their mother. As they were leaving, an explosion occurred, killing them both. Junho then saw that there were monsters outside and didn't care about what happened to his brother. As they were talking, the collector mocked them, but Suho defended them by grabbing the collector by the head and throwing him away. He then asked Junho if he was okay. When one of the guys attacked with a kick, his leg broke on Suho's head, causing the man to fall to the ground in pain. The other guy was scared seeing Suho was an awakener. Suho called the other guy over and paid him cash as he told him to take the money and leave. They then left and went to Junho's house. Junho introduced Suho to an old lady, and they went inside the house where they saw Gunwoo, Junho's son, asleep. Suho asked where the mother was and Junho told him that she had already left. As they sat at the table, Junho told Suho that he had thought he was dead and expressed surprise that he was an awakener. Suho inquired about the amount of Junho's debt, and Junho informed him it was 50,000. However, he reassured Suho that he can pay it off, since he had secured a job at a logistics center, where the pay was good. Suho questioned if the truck belonged to Junho, and he replied that it actually belonged to the old lady's deceased son, that had died in the great disaster, and she had lent it to him. Gunwoo then woke up and greeted Suho. Suho then offered Junho the opportunity to work with him and assist him in hunting. The staff were taken aback by the fact that Suho had awakened and managed to enhance his status within a day. They informed him that he could use his Awakener ID to open an account and provided him with a phone for registering as an Awakener. They reminded him to download the Awakener Bureau app as it would have information about exams and hunting. They then demonstrated to him how to access his status screen. Once he saw his stats, he was perplexed by the fact that some of his stats were too low. Suho located the nearest dungeon, the Namyangyu Gate, and decided to go there. In the car, the three people in the back were nervous on entering the dungeon, the driver assured them that they can become part of the Shilla Guild's raiders if they cleared this mission. The other man was pissed as these people only relied on their connections to get here. One of the guard was worried seeing Suho enter alone without any equipment. The guard told him that it was fine as he recognized him as the one who killed seven goblins in Gate 27 yesterday. The people in the car thought Suho was crazy, the man told the driver to hurry up and follow Suho, but when they turned the corner Suho was already gone. The other man thinks that he found something interesting. Meanwhile, Suho was running at full speed and realized he had become weakened and needed to train again. He heard sword clashing in the distance and decided to investigate. Upon arriving, he saw a group of people robbing three individuals. Suddenly, a large man appeared and one of the victims recognized him as Choi Gushik, a man with a high bounty on his head. Initially, Suho was going to walk away, but upon hearing the amount of the bounty, he changed his mind. 
The three individuals were terrified as Choi Gushik charged at them, but then Suho appeared, surprising everyone. Suho approached Gushik and told him he needed money. Gushik laughed and used his skill on Suho, rendering him unable to move. Gushik explained that by looking into his eyes for five seconds, he was able to paralyze him and then ordered his men to take care of Suho. Despite being paralyzed, Suho weakly punched Gushik, wondering if it was magic and finding it intriguing. Gushik used another skill called Bind to stop Suho's attack, then pulled out a knife with the intention of attacking. But Suho kneed him in the face and asked if he had anything better. Gushik attempted to use Bind again, but Suho punched him in the face and delivered multiple punches to his body before throwing him through a building, finding it uninteresting. Suho asked Gushik's men if they wanted to fight, but they surrendered. Suho instructed the individuals being robbed to tie them up. Suho asked the robbers how much their bounties were, but they denied having any and told him that Gushik was the only one with a bounty. Gushik cursed upon hearing this, calling them traitors. One of the people he saved told Suho that they were lying and that they were all criminals and likely had bounties on them. He advised Suho to hand them over to the authorities. Gushik offered to team up with Suho, but Suho knocked him unconscious by kicking him in the face. The people he saved offered to use their car to transport the criminals, and Suho put them all to sleep. Inside the car, the three people thanked Suho for saving them and told him about their skills, explaining that they had learned them from skill books. Suho found this interesting. The driver was confused as to why Suho didn't know about these things. Suho decided to learn a few skills, as he may need them in the future. Suho pointed out the portal as the driver confirms and that they intended to go there. Suho wanted to go, but he doesn't have his mercenary license yet. The driver was shocked hearing this and found it unbelievable for a rookie to defeat a seer anchor like Choi Gushik. The driver asked Suho's rank, he answered he was rank F, which surprised everyone. Suho then asked him a favor. Meanwhile, the people from the Shilla guild emerged from a portal, one of them was injured, and the leader was furious thinking that licenses were being given away to weaklings. He said that people with money can easily become awakeners, all they need to do was deliver a killing blow to the monsters that the brokers have captured for them, then hire mercenaries to carry them through the dungeons, join a guild and go on missions. But the people with them suffer as these people are inexperienced in battle. The captain exclaimed that he doesn't like these kinds of people, but his subordinate calmed him down and invited him for a drink. The captain asked about the level 1 dungeon that was about to disappear, and one of the soldiers informed them that someone had handed over 10 ravagers to them, including the seer anchor, Choi Gushik. The captain was surprised and thought that some higher anchor must have done it. The soldier told him it was done by a newbie F ranker who didn't have a mercenary license. The soldier continued that the F ranker had just defeated Choi Gushik and broke his ribs and face. The captain remembered the man they had gone after earlier and asked the soldier where the F ranker had gone, the soldier replied that they had gone through a portal. The captain ran back and wanted to see for himself, he felt that he was onto something. The captain asked the operator which door Suho used. Meanwhile, Suho just entered a portal and was amazed that his clothes were fine. The guy with him explained that those clothes are made with materials found in dungeons and that they were expensive. The door closed behind them, and the guy with him explained that it will open once they clear the dungeon by killing the boss, Suho told the guy to wait as he jumped away. The guy was stunned seeing Suho's strength and thought he might set a record for clearing the dungeon, but then he remembered that Suho doesn't have a search skill and worried that he wouldn't be able to find the door location, resulting in them being trapped inside as he chased after him. Suho attacked a group of goblins and took away the blood crystals and made raising his level a priority. The guy saw the bodies of the goblins and was surprised he used track to find Suho. Suho was checking his stats and saw that he has 102 achievement points and can buy two skills with it. He chose the tame beast skill, suddenly a group of goblins attacked him from behind, but he easily defeated them, which gave him more achievement points. A critical error message appeared and saw his stats increase, he bought the other skill summon a tree spirit and tested it out. He ordered the fairy to look for the remaining goblins, and he found out that the spirit sends the information it sees to him. He also bought the track and search skills with his remaining points, he heard something and headed to that direction, as he saw a goblin was attacking his companion. The guy asked for his help as Suho jumped in pushing the goblin back. Before the goblin can attack Suho rushed in and attacks sending it crashing to the walls. He delivers the finishing blow as he levels up and got 120 achievement points. Suho's companion was surprised to see how easily did the boss was killed. 
Suho confirmed if the doors will be opening, and his companion answered that they should be. They exited the dungeon as the guards called Captain Kang after seeing them. His companion thanked him and left, after changing his clothes Captain Kang greeted and introduced himself as captain of the 27th combat team from the Shilla guild. The captain invited Suho to join their guild and promised the best environment for his growth, Suho immediately rejected him. The captain thought that Suho just wanted to increase the offer. He tried to convince Suho with another offer Suho stopped by saying that he doesn't like working under someone. At home, Suho gave Junho money to pay off his debt and told him to settle it so they could eat later. Junho was grateful and tearfully thanked Suho before leaving. Meanwhile, Suho noticed that he could name the pup, and he chose the name Bekdu. Then he looked at the pup's stats. After some time, Junho came home and Suho and Gunwoo welcomed him, but they were shocked to see that Junho was injured and covered in blood. He collapsed to the ground and they ran to him in concern. In the lone shark's office, they were discussing something when they heard a commotion outside. Suddenly, the door opened and one of the men tried to speak, but he was pulled away. The thugs tried to investigate what was happening, but they were stopped when one of their members was thrown at them. Suo then entered, carrying a closet and threw it at the thugs, injuring everyone. The boss was terrified as Suho kicked over his table, crushing him. Suho asked if he was Kim jing Su, and jing Su confirmed it. Suho then laid an envelope on the table and told jing Su that he would pay off jun -ho's debt. jing Su tried to threaten Suho, but he was slapped multiple times by Suho, while being told why they had to beat up jun -ho, and that they just needed to take the money. The boss begged for mercy, and Suho asked him if he would settle the debt or be slapped to death. The boss chose to settle, and the group knelt in front of Suho, announcing that jun -ho's debt was now cleared. Suho told them that he didn't want to see them again. After Suho left, the boss was furious and began planning his revenge. Suho visited Junho at the hospital and found he was recovering well, Junho reminded him about his mercenary exam tomorrow and told him that it will be nice if he passed and joined a big guild. Suho thought it was impossible to work under someone, as he was the king of the forest. Suho told him that he will be making his own guild. At the Awakener's bureau, Su Young was getting scolded by her superior for not performing her job properly. She was then assigned to be one of the supervisors of the mercenary exam and was told not to reject everyone as she left the room in anger. At the exam location, one guy was streaming while he waited for the exams to start. Then the guy noticed Suho standing beside him, and Suho asked who he was talking to earlier. The guy was annoyed, but Suho found him funny. The head supervisor greeted everyone and introduced himself and the 21 supervisors. Every examinee was hoping to be assigned to a good supervisor, with many specifically hoping to avoid the one known as the witch, who had failed half of the applicants assigned to her. The examinees were assigned to supervisors based on the number given to them and were told to line up in front of their designated supervisor. The guy earlier named Han Ding Su and Park Suho were both assigned to supervisor number 15. Suho was surprised when he saw that Su Young was their supervisor, as she also noticed him. After, they were told to go to their waiting room. Ding Su lost hope as he thought he was going home early, Suho asked him why he was gloomy, Ding Su told him why, explaining that their supervisor was called the witch because she fails applicants if she has a bad day. Suho told Ding Su that it's not the supervisor's fault and that it's because he was unprepared for the exam. Ding Su was angry as he glared at Suho, but Suho invited him to solve the problem like men and fight. Ding Su stood up and told Suho to follow him. Meanwhile, Ding Su and Suho were in a ring while the other examinees watched. Ding Su showed off his boxing abilities with the intention of teaching Suho a lesson. However, Suho found it amusing. Ding Su attempted to attack, but was stopped by Su Young's arrival. She instructed everyone to return to the waiting room. Ding Su attempted to explain himself, but she silenced him and stated that she only needed one person to take the blame and that it would be the loser. She encouraged them to fight. Ding Su asked Suho not to hold a grudge against him, but Suho apologized for what was about to transpire. Ding Su attacked, but Suho countered and knocked him out. Su Young was shocked and had thought that Suho was the source of her discomfort since she saw him come out of the portal. Suho interrupted her thoughts and asked if she also wanted to fight him, but only under the condition that if he won, she wouldn't disqualify Ding Su. Su Young thought Suho was insane and entered the ring. She asked if he was an irregular, but Suho was confused by the term. She promised to explain it to him if he survived the fight. She swung a punch at Suho, but he dodged and blocked her next attacks. 
As they continued to fight, she told Suho that if he won, she would grant him one wish in addition to his original request. She threw a kick and suspected that Suho was keeping something hidden. Suho was impressed with her strength and praised it. She continued to attack, but Suho was able to dodge them. She then began throwing punches and kicks, which Suho countered with a punch. However, she used a shield to block it, but the shield shattered and pushed her back. Suho charged at her, enjoying the fight. She believed that Suho was an irregular, and when he was close to her, she raised her hand and surrendered. Suho was confused, but she explained that the space was too small for her to use her full abilities and suggested they continue the fight at another time. She asked him what he wanted. Suho inquired if there were many strong women like her on earth. She replied that there were not many. He then suggested that they make babies together. She slapped him in response and left, calling him crazy. He considered leaving himself as he felt he had lost the fight and blamed Suho for getting him disqualified. Suho explained that he was not disqualified. In an office, a man was surprised to see Su Young's loss as he had been watching the fight on camera. Ding Su was confused, and Suho explained to him that he had asked Su Young to overlook his disqualification. Ding Su then wondered why Su Young had slapped him and thought it was his fault. He cried and referred to Suho as his big brother. Suddenly, they heard that Suho was being summoned to the supervisor's office. Suho met with the man who had observed his fight with Su Young and informed him that their conversation would be recorded. The man revealed that he was shocked to see Suho fight a beer ank awakener and questioned if he was an irregular. The man then explained about bridge portals that connect Earth to three other planets, one of which is Asura, where dwarves and elves live in harmony with Earth. Earthlings who have returned from Asura have acquired skills related to magic and artifact crafting. The next planet is Gutchian, which is inhabited by mammons and martial artists. The martial artists are allies of Earth, while the mammons are Earth's enemies. Lastly, there is Mitter, a planet ruled by orcs and overrun with vicious monsters, and whenever a portal opens to Mitter, an all-out war is expected to occur. The Earthlings who came back from these planets, there are people who learned powerful skills and whose combat abilities exceeded those of Awakeners are called Irregulars. Suho found it complicated and was certain that the place he went to wasn't one of those planets. There was thinking if Suho was just a dungeon returner that doesn't explain how he can fight a beer anchor. Then asked Suho what kind of planet he came back from. Suho told his story. The man thanked him and told him to head back to the waiting room. After Suho left the office, the man was surprised by Suho's story and called in a soldier to take over as supervisor number 15 and ordered him to monitor Suho and provide a detailed report after the exam was over. In the exams, Ding Su passed the 100 meter dash and Suho came in next, surprising everyone with his speed. The major received a call with Suho's exam results and sent a video to Kim Mizo of the Returner Bureau, instructing her to watch it immediately. Kim Mizo's assistant informed her that the major was able to detect lies and that the interview Suho had with the doctor was true. She realized that Suho came from a fourth planet and ordered for the reporters to be removed from the training grounds, but it was too late as the assistant had already seen an article about Suho. She ordered for it to be taken down as well. Kim Mizo was contemplating that Suho was able to maintain his physical condition after passing through the portal without protective gear and was given an F rank due to a lack of dimensional energy. She also considered that if Suho was truly from a fourth planet, Korea might gain an advantage in the development of the unknown fourth planet. Meanwhile, the reporters were being prevented from contacting Suho. As they were eating, Ding Su observed Suho and realized that he was on a different level and believed that Suho would become popular. In the waiting room, only two of them were left, and Ding Su assumed that only two of them had passed the exam and worried that they would be in trouble for the next exam, which would involve raiding dungeons and would require more members. Suho reassured him and told him not to worry. Ding Su was thinking that if Suho performed well on the raid, top guilds would be interested in recruiting him. Suho then invited Ding Su to join his clan, as he didn't plan on joining a guild. Ding Su had an idea that if he made a video documenting the founding of a clan and going on raids, it would be a big opportunity for him. Ding Su agreed while he cried and told Suho that they need three people to form a clan, a monk suddenly enters the room and introduced himself as Myongjin. They heard an announcement telling the applicants to change to their battle suits and assemble in the briefing room in 30 minutes. The monk told them that examiners occasionally hold dungeon raids at night without notice. Ding Su exclaimed and found it insane. 
The group was given information about the dungeon they were going to raid and found out it was under the protection of the Phoenix Guild. Suho asked for clarification on what under protection meant. Ding Su was surprised Suho didn't know and explained that portals to other dimensions were appearing all over the city and the government was struggling to deal with them. The government had hired groups, called guilds, to manage and protect different areas of the city and gave them the authority to process the dimensional energy from the dungeons they controlled. Suho understood and realized he had only wanted to create his own clan because he missed hunting with his old pack. He was happy to be able to have a place of his own while doing it. Ding Su added that it's beneficial to own a dungeon as you don't have to pay to use it. Suho informed the group that their ultimate goal was to form a guild, but Ding Su interjected by saying that they first needed to pass the mercenary exam. The dungeon they were about to raid had only 15 days left before it broke, and it was a labyrinth-type dungeon with the lowest difficulty and fewest monsters among all dungeons. Ding Su expressed concern that they could get lost in the labyrinth, but Suho reassured him that he had search skills. Ding Su inquired about the monk's abilities, and the monk remembered his past experience that with his skill, monsters of all types came to the temple. One of the monks had warned him to stop and advised him to take the priest and evacuate, but it was too late as a monster had already ambushed from behind. Myongjin was startled after the briefing was finished. On their way to the portal, the supervisor instructed them to ignore him and continue with their mission once they entered, and reminded them that even if they successfully cleared the dungeon, their individual scores could still fail. As soon as they entered the dungeon, a skeleton attacked Suho, but he easily defeated it. Ding Su reminded Suho to use his search skills while progressing. However, the monk accidentally triggered a trap, and arrows were launched at them. Myongjin stepped forward and blocked the arrows with his staff. Ding Su complimented Myongjin's proficiency with his staff, but, unfortunately, he also stepped on a trap, and they all fell to a lower level of the dungeon. They heard the monsters coming. And the monk apologized that his skill was an AoE taunt. Suho approved as he was too lazy to look for the monsters. Suho kicked the ceiling and jumped up and invited the monk to join their clan. He used his search skill and found the traps then charged onto the wave of monsters. When the monk and Ding Su came out of the hole they saw the pile of bodies Suho left behind, Suho told them to follow him and take care of the knockdown monsters. The supervisor was impressed that Suho was using the traps to his advantage. One skeleton tried to attack Suho from above, but the monk threw his staff killing it. The soldiers saw that someone returned from the dungeon, one was confused, saying that dungeon will take 5 hours to finish and only 30 minutes have passed. They saw it was Park Suho's team. The supervisor informed them that they finished the dungeon and watched the video, and it will be hard to measure their stats in a level 1 dungeon. Ding Su was streaming for his blog about the Suho clan, and gave a tour of the clan house, introducing Granny Sukjev and the monk Myungjin. Later in the day, they entered a dungeon and saw many bats, and Ding Su asked if they had long-range skills to catch them. Myungjin told them to leave it to him and used his skills to lure the bats to them. The bats came to Myungjin, and he used his fire wheel skill to kill them. The boss came out and Suho killed it instantly with one shot, clearing the dungeon. Kim Maizo received updates on the progress of Suho's group, who were completing dungeons 20 times daily. She remembered Lee Sungwoo, a Korean irregular who had transferred to Japan, and decided to contact Suho directly. At the clan house, they were searching for Myungjin, who did not show up for work that day. Junho reassured Suho that it was okay to take a break and informed them that the team had qualified to advance to a higher level and had earned enough money to enter level 2 dungeons. Ding Su was excited about the potential earnings. Suho agreed to let the team rest for the day and invited Junho to go shopping for a new truck. They purchased the latest model and headed to a field to aid in Junho's awakening. Junho was nervous and wants to leave, but Suho came out of the car and jumped away. The loan sharks were watching a video of the Suho clan. The boss asked for the list of guilds they are funding and remembered a guy called Manager Choi. They found him perfect for making people disappear as he already erased six people. The boss ordered to contact him and give him however much he wants for the job. Kim Maizo arrived in the Suho clan and found Granny Sukja and introduced herself from the Returner's Bureau. In the car, Junho was nervously waiting for Suho, but suddenly a goblin dropped on the car as Suho ordered him to get out of the car. Suho gave him a knife and told him to kill it and follow him, Junho was having second thoughts about awakening, but Suho told him he won't survive if he is weak and orders him again to kill it. Suho ordered Beku to attack and bite the goblin. Beku bit the arm of the goblin. 
Suho told Junho that Beku can't kill the goblin and that if he didn't attack Beku will die. Junho stabbed the goblin and it released Beku. While Suho orders him to repeat. Junho kept stabbing and saw the blood on his hands. Suho told him that if he doesn't kill he will die and told him to follow while killing the other goblins. Junho saw Suho walking away and remembered the time he abandoned him. He picked up the knife and stabbed the goblin in the head and kept stabbing its body. He laughed crazily seeing the blood. A goblin jumped at him causing him to fall. He stabbed it in the neck. Junho was mumbling like a psycho and Suho saw his information window showing butcher and found it cute. He invited Junho to come up to clean up the rest. They went to the Awakener's bureau with Junho covered with blood, making the staff nervous and told them to clean up first and get quarantined and to head to the third floor to measure their dimensional energy. Suho explained to Junho that his dimensional energy needs to be more than 100 to be registered as an F-rank Awakener and be qualified to take the mercenary exam. Junho's measurement was 111 was told to go to the ability manifestation room. Suho went next, but he saw multiple eyes observing him he stood up in shock. The doctor compliments him and said that he will reach year rank soon. Suho asked who made the machine. Junho received his certificate of awakening and Suho congratulated him. Suho asked if Junho felt anything strange during the examination and Junho replied no. Suho asked about Junho's awakened skill, which is called decapitation. On the way out, they saw Su Young with her squat and Suho attempted to apologize, but she stopped him and said she didn't want to see him again, then left. Su Young's squad laughed, thinking Suho had been dumped. Kim Maizo was speaking with Granny when Suho arrived. She introduced herself and stated that she had come to present him with a contract. She explained about the human coordinate and how Suho had returned through a red portal. She told him that the conditions were met for success, as the return of a returner is the signal for success. Kim Maizo also informed Suho that the portal would open again, acting as a bridge for coming and going. Suho asked where and Kim Maizo directed him to the coordinate. Suho thought that he might have the chance to meet his wolf friends again. Kim Maizo explained that the bureau suspects that the planet Suho came from is the fourth new planet. If this is true, Korea would be the only country with a bridge portal to that planet, which may appear in 99 days. Suho asked what they wanted from him, and Kim Maizo said that they want him to stay in the country until the portal appears, and they don't want him to become another Lee Sung Woo. Suho asked who that was, and Kim Maizo explained that Lee Sung Woo is the current rank 1 Akita hero, who is originally Korean, but he escaped from government facility during the early days of disaster. The Japanese government approached him and he moved to Japan. Now, the 9000 planet gates in Tokyo are because of him. She also mentioned that if the portal opens while he is abroad, it would cause a significant loss for Korea. Suho understands the situation and asked what he will get in return, Kim Maizo replied by asking what he wants. Suho stated that he wants the promotion of the Suho Guild and exclusive territory for the guild. Ding Su, who was listening, was shocked. Kim Maizo asked if he has any more requests and asked him to write them in detail. Suho asked how to know if a portal is about to open, and she replied that they will dispatch an agent of the bureau, a specialized agent in dimensional energy cracks. Meanwhile, Su Young is angry as she remembers Suho's face while kicking and punching the heavy bag, while saying she should have sent Suho to jail for harassment. Kim Maizo arrived and told her to go on a dispatch. Su Young was unhappy when she was assigned her mission and expressed her frustration to Maizo. Maizo explained that they cannot allow a portal to open in a populated area and instructed Su Young to take Suho and leave the area immediately if she detects any signs of a dimensional crack. And to stay close to him at all times. Ding Su was pleased as their guild passed the evaluation and was now able to enter level 2 dungeons. Junho suggested that it would be best to continue focusing on level 1 dungeons as they were still short on personnel. Suho decided to earn money by completing the level 1 dungeon and leveling up through skill books. Myungjin arrived and they set off for the dungeon together. At the entrance, they ran into Jeshik, who was on a different team. Suho asked why, but Jeshik didn't respond and instead told them he had to go, saying goodbye before rejoining his party. As Suho and his team entered the dungeon, a man observed them from a distance. Jeshik felt uneasy, as he couldn't bring himself to tell Suho that his clan had been disbanded and that two of his clanmates had left under the guise of needing medical treatment. The collapse of a clan is common when its core members are gone. Level 0 clans are often formed and dissolved easily, and the high stress levels caused by the work environment often led members to quit working as mercenaries. 
Meanwhile, Suyong was on her way to Suho's group after receiving the location from Maizo. Inside the dungeon, Myungjin used his new skill, Dragon Charge, to kill multiple monsters, while Junho was causing a massacre among the monsters. Ding Su warned Junho about a monster attacking him from behind, which Junho easily killed while smiling. Suho was pleased with how well his group was performing. On Jeshik's side, his team was in a state of panic and had accidentally injured him with a skill. Jeshik watched as his team was being eaten by monsters, feeling envious of Suho's group and believing they would not let him join their team. After exiting the dungeon, Suho's team was greeted by a man named Myungwu, who introduced himself as a member of the BDG guild. Ding Su was surprised because it was a level 5 guild in Area 4 and the owner of the portal they had just completed. The guild was ranked 20th in the country. Myungwu told them that they were in the same area and offered them a small gift, which was a free entrance to one of their level 2 dungeons. Ding Su was happy, as it would have cost them a lot of money to enter a level 2 dungeon. Junho was hesitant and suggested that they should prepare first before going to a level 2 dungeon. Myungwu reassured them that they would provide them with strategy notes and equipment as a gift. Suho told his group to go to the level 1 dungeon to improve their teamwork and that he would go to the level 2 dungeon alone for efficiency. Myungwu smiled upon hearing this, and the group agreed. Before Suho entered the level 2 dungeon, he offered Myungwu a drink when he came out. Myungwu agreed and urged Suho to hurry. After Suho entered the dungeon, Su Young arrived and asked Myungwu where Suho was. She then quickly ran towards the portal and entered it. Inside the dungeon, Suho was surveying the area when Su Young appeared and told him not to look as her clothes were destroyed by the portal. She used her bracelet to summon a new outfit, but noticed Suho watching her. She called him a pervert, but Suho reminded her that she had also seen him naked when he came out of the portal, making them even. Suho then asked why she was there. She replied that she had been sent as his guardian. Suho was surprised, thinking they would send a more competent person. She insisted that she was capable and that her mission was to evaluate Suho's skills. Suho told her not to interfere with his targets as an orc appeared behind him. She recognized it as an orc warrior and thought it was the dungeon boss, but Suho told her that four bosses were approaching them. She was skeptical because they were in a level 2 dungeon. Suho explained that this was not a level 2 dungeon based on what he felt upon entering the portal and questioned her capabilities. She made an excuse as Suho charged towards the enemy, warning her not to touch his prey. Suho knocked down the orc and grabbed its axe, delivering the killing blow. Another orc appeared, and Suho threw the axe, hitting it in the head and killing it instantly. One of the orcs was unaware as Suho dropped down on it. Outside, Myungwu was requesting payment and expressing doubt that Suho would be able to come out of the dungeon alive. Meanwhile, Suho killed an orc by crushing its head, saying that it didn't matter what level the dungeon was, he would just have to kill them all, as another orc charged towards him. Suho evaded the orc's attack and delivered a kick to its head, sending it flying. He received achievement points and handed his bag to Suyoung, telling her to help him collect the blood crystals from the orcs. She thought that Suho had only F-rank experience, but she observed no hesitation in his hunting routine and thought he was a psychopath. She reminded him that even though he killed four boss-ranked monsters, the gate did not appear and there were only stones inside the bag. She explained that this was a level 4 dungeon and it would be difficult for them to leave even if they worked together. Suho believed that Myungwu had assisted him by allowing him to enter a level 4 dungeon without charge. Suyoung, however, believed Suho to be foolish. As an orc attacked her, she realized she had left her sword outside. Suho arrived and quickly defeated the orc, telling her not to worry as he was strong, though he had been stronger before. Suyoung was surprised by this revelation. As they heard something approaching, she used her skill of clairvoyance and saw an approaching army of orcs, causing her to curse. She informed him that an army of orcs, led by a warchief, was approaching. Suho was excited to hear this. As the orc riders arrived, Suho and Suyoung charged at them. Suho quickly killed one of the riders, while Suyoung summoned a sword and injured another. However, she was disappointed with the summoned sword and regretted leaving her primary weapon behind. Suho arrived and finished off the injured rider and then killed the others nearby. As Suho charged towards another group of orcs, he was hit by the orc warchief, causing him to fly backwards. He quickly regained his footing and attacked the warchief, managing to stab it, but it was not enough to kill it. The warchief hit Suho with its mace. Meanwhile, Kim Maizo was informed that Su Young and Suho's phones were in different locations and there had been no movement for the past hour. 
She was confused as she had thought that Soo-young was with Suho. The assistant told her that Soo-young's phone was located near a recently opened level 5 dungeon. She asked why they had entered the dungeon and who was managing it. They discovered that the dungeon was being managed by the DGB guild. She ordered them to check the dungeon records and tell the DGB to contact her immediately. Suho was sent crashing into a rock, but instead of feeling discouraged, he smiled at the challenge. He tackled one of the orcs and threw it into another. He picked up their weapons and used them to attack the orcs. Suyoung was targeted by the archers, but she skillfully dodged and used her defense bomb skill to kill the orcs that were approaching her. Suho grabbed her and told her they needed to run away. He carried her and jumped off a cliff. As they landed, several orcs fell to their deaths. Suyoung was confused about how they had survived such a fall as Suho let her go. They took shelter in a cave, and she asked him what his plan was. Suho said that he needed to kill four more orcs to level up, then he would attack. She told him that leveling up only increases one's limits, not their power. Suho explained that to him, leveling up is like removing his restrictions and can be considered a power-up. Outside the gate, the media was reporting on an accident involving Suho and Suyoung entering a level 5 gate. Suho's group was present, while Ding Su was crying. Myung Wu was arrested and admitted to his crimes. Kim Maizo entered the director's office and demanded the arrest of all those involved. The director informed her that all suspects had been apprehended, except for the leader of the Dragon Loans who had fled and had a bounty on his head. Kim Maizo felt guilty as she was the one who had sent Suyoung to tail Suho. In the dungeon, Suho used his fairy to lure one of the orcs and ambushed it. He smiled, as he only needed three more kills to level up. Suyoung warned Suho that there was an orc ahead, but he quickly dashed away before she could tell him it was a trap. The orc triggered a trap, sending Suho flying backwards. The orc then signaled for others to emerge from their hiding spots. Suho struggled to stand up, realizing that his senses were dulling and he was losing strength. Suyoung shouted that he had been starving for two days as she killed the approaching orcs with her skills and then collapsed on the ground. Suho picked up a weapon and killed two orcs. He attempted to kill another to level up, but was again attacked by the war chief, causing him to hit another orc as they fell. Suho's weapon fell on the orc, killing it and causing him to level up. A message popped up asking him to activate the skill beast transformation. The war chief approached the weakened Suyoung and prepared to attack. In the Suho clan, House Granny was feeding Beku. Suho used his beast transformation skill, and Granny was shocked to see Beku floating and shining. Suho began to transform as Suyoung fought the war chief. She was hit and fell to the ground. Suho charged in his werewolf form and relentlessly attacked the war chief, hitting it multiple times and finally finishing it with a bite to its neck. Suyoung was afraid, thinking that Suho had lost his senses. But Suho responded with a bark, and she realized that he had transformed into a dog, not a wolf. Outside, the media reported that it had been three days since Suho and Suyoung's disappearance. The director explained that they had entered a level 5 dungeon known as Art Castle, where it was recommended to bring a party of 30 members with a B rank, or with 10 A ranks. Suho returned to human form and discovered that it wasn't a transformation, but a fusion. He invited Suyoung to eat, but she told him that it was pointless and that this place would be their grave. She explained that even though the war chief had died, the door was not opening, indicating that there were stronger monsters inside. Suho asked what kind of monster made her lose hope. She remembered an incident from three years ago when they had raided a level 5 dungeon with a 20-man combat team and 10 A-ranked mercenaries. Suyoung was asked by a man if her ankles were okay, while Kim Maizo teased them from behind. As they struggled in battle, the man saved Suyoung by using his skills. Kim Maizo ordered them to retreat, and as they were running, Suyoung felt something targeting them. Suddenly, Tehun's arm was cut off and his sword fell beside her. Everyone was shocked as they saw the boss finish Tehun off, and Suyoung cried. Suho comforted her after hearing her story. Outside the gate, many people thought that Suho and Suyoung had died. Many higher anchors are gathering as they plan for revenge. Akita Hiro was watching as he thought what they are doing is stupid. In the cave, after they finished eating, Suho asked if she was the one who defeated the orc lord, she replied no as she fainted on the spot and woke up in the hospital, while Maizo brought her to Hoon's sword. Two air-ranked mercenaries died to defeat the orc lord. It was capable of defeating five orc warchiefs at the same time. Suho asked where is the orc lord. She assumed it was in a castle. Suho's fairy returned and told her they found the orc castle. Suho and Suyoung saw the castle gate open and charged towards it. 
The orcs fired arrows, but Su Young used her shield to block them, and they managed to enter before the gate closed. Once inside, Su Young blasted the orcs blocking their path and charged towards one of the spires. The orcs jumped towards them, and she was hit by an orc and fell. However, she told Suho to continue and not to worry about her. As she fell on the edge, Su Young prepared herself to battle the approaching orcs. The orc leader sensed something amiss and stood up abruptly, but Suho quickly appeared, biting and attacking its neck. The orc leader fell onto one of the spires, impaling itself. The spire collapsed, crushing the orcs beneath it. Su Young used her abilities to destroy another spire. She thought she was going to die as she fell, but Suho quickly caught her and brought her safely to the ground. She was amazed at how quickly Suho had taken down the orc leader. Suho instructed her to search for the door. As the clock began counting down to the dungeon's collapse, Su Young located the door and guided Suho to it. They had only 10 minutes left before the door burst, and the orcs were still in pursuit. Suho then caught a scent and discovered a cage containing wolves. Using his ability to tame animals, he commanded the pack to follow him and devised a plan to escape the dungeon with them. With orcs closing in on them, the fairy informed Suho of another exit nearby. They found it and successfully made it out of the castle. They could see the door with just 23 seconds left before the collapse. Suddenly, one of the orcs threw a spear and hit Su Young in the back, causing her to fall. Suho quickly ran back and killed the orc. With only 8 seconds left, people outside were already weeping. Suho picked up Su Young and urged her to hold on. He sprinted with all his might towards the exit gate. The gate closed just as the world inside was destroyed. As the countdown reached its end, those outside lost all hope. However, the people were surprised as a pack of wolves emerged from the portal, followed by Suho and Su Young falling to the ground. The crowd rushed towards them. The news quickly spread that the two individuals who were trapped in the level 5 dungeon had returned alive after 4 days and 11 hours. Kim Maizo was in a briefing about what happened, and the news about Park Suho have spread due to the incident. The scouts from different countries arrived in the country, and they were thinking of ways to secure Suho, the doctor assured that as long as Suho's family is in Korea. He will not leave and attaches value in spending time with his family. He advised to give Suho a territory where he can live with his family and not invade it. The director agreed. Kim Maizo suggested a location, the abandoned facility in the Myangyu, and found it the most suitable area for the Suho Guild as their territory, and decided to keep Suyoung to watch over Suho. In the SPFC arena Akita Hero was introduced as a black flame was spreading on his sword. He jumped to stage as the crowd cheered. The Challenger S rank human weapon is Michael Zorbas. Zorbas entered the stage and immediately attacked with a punch destroying the area, but Hero dodged, Zorbas followed with a mana gatling wild shot, while Hero evades his attacks. Hero then counterattacks putting Zorbas on the defensive and taking his own sword and swinging, but Hero easily dodges his attacks. Hero attacked Zorbas multiple times, but Zorbas didn't notice it. Zorbas then caught Hero with his chains. Binding him Zorbas tried to attack, but Hero told him that he was already dead, Zorbas suddenly fall down blood pouring everywhere. The medics came in but failed to rescue Zorbas. A woman welcomed Hero into his office, and he explained that Zorbas will be one of the seven villains in the future, which is why he killed him. She then informed him about the person that got trapped in a level 5 dungeon had succeeded in getting out, and that he may be the second coming of Lee Sung Woo in Korea. Even the Department of Defense is interested in him. Hiro was curious and asked who was it. She replied that it was Park Suho. Hiro can't remember him. She then said that he was Druid and Returner from a fourth planet. Hiro thought that it will not happen, he was in his 25th regression, and repeated the same events over and over for 500 years. As a result, he remembers all the Awakener who will make a name for themselves in the future, and a general outline of major events that will happen, but Park Suho is not on that list. He doubts that Suho was a returner from a fourth planet. Stating that history may change a little based on his actions. Such as one of the seven villains who will show his evil in ten years suddenly dying and Akiko who should have died two years ago still safe and alive. But the major events like the time when a level 7 dungeon appeared or when the planet was connected to the fourth planet have never changed, and that is five years from now. A new planet won't appear before then. Hiro was asked by Akiko to bring Suho to their side, but he replied to wait. He knows the apocalypse is near, and cities that once sheltered survivors are falling to monster invasions from dungeon breaches. 
The heroes among the evacuees chose Japan as their last hope for survival, so Hiro decided to build his base there, despite being labeled a traitor. He believes that by securing the dungeons and attracting talented individuals, Japan will become the best place for survivors. Upon arriving in Japan, refugees see Lee sun Wu waiting for them, who hopes to be seen as a hero rather than a traitor by the Korean survivors. Hiro smiled at the thought. Hiro believes that Suho's actions are just for appearance and says they can bring him over after the apocalypse starts. Kim Mizo visits Su Young in the hospital and asks about a rumored man who visits her every night, suspecting it to be Suho. Su Young avoids the question and asks about the food. At the CIA headquarters, a man is shocked at the news of Hiro killing Zorbas, and his assistant speculates that Hiro married Chess's rank. They are also observing Suho and notice he frequently visits the same location and appears to be talking to pigeons. The man at the CIA headquarters instructs his assistant to bring Suho to their site at all costs. The assistant informs him that agents have been sent to Korea, but the airways are unstable. On the plane, passengers see a young wyvern flying nearby, and the agents wonder if a wyvern dungeon has burst. They plan to contact HQ upon landing, but an adult wyvern suddenly breathes fire, causing the plane to crash. A news report states that a group of wyverns escaped during a dungeon break two days prior. Suho and his group arrive at their new headquarters. Suyoung complains about a ghost in the house and expresses her concern to Kim Mizo. Kim Mizo tells Suho they will renovate the house, but Suho thinks it's fine and wants to move in right away. Suyoung asks him if he's crazy, but Kim Mizo intervenes and discusses establishing territorial boundaries. Kim Mizo explains that Suho can choose the amount of land he will manage. Suho summons his spirits, and when Kim Mizo questions what he's doing, Su Young informs her that he's setting territorial boundaries. The tree spirits grow trees that form a wall around their territory, astonishing everyone with its size. Suho states it covers a radius of one kilometer with the house at the center. Kim Mizo says everything within the territory will belong to the Suho guild. Suho asks why they are being so accommodating when he only needs to stay in the country for a few months. Kim Mizo replies that the bureau treats Suho like family. Suho is pleased. Kim Mizo hands him a contract to sign, but Su Young advises him to read it thoroughly before signing, before Kim Mizo pulls her away. Kim Mizo leaves and during the car ride, the driver asks her if the Suho clan can manage such a big territory. Mizo answers that if they can't, the bureau can use it as an excuse to send in their own people. She orders to make a list of attacking units over a certain level and have them ready. In the next scene, a cargo ship is being attacked by pirates who are asking for help. As the pirates board the ship, they suddenly see their boat being thrown into the air and multiple tentacles wrapping around the ship, causing it to capsize. One of the crew members sees a shark-like monster swallowing him, and a group of monsters are shown surrounding the sea. The rescue team arrives but finds no sign of the ship, and the tentacles attack them. Meanwhile, Suho was giving names to his wolves. He realized that if they had more dimensional energy than him, he could potentially lose his sanity during fusion. Suyoung showed up and Suho asked her to join him on a walk. He transformed and offered her a ride. Reporters were outside, waiting for updates on the Suho clan when Ding Su and Junho passed by. Ding Su noticed that his channel was receiving donations from various countries and pondered whether to inform Suho. The two of them saw Suho and Suyoung and challenged them to a race, but Suyoung suddenly sensed a dimensional crack within a 200-meter radius. Suyoung remembered her previous conversation with Suho, in which she asked about the type of planet he visited. He replied that it was an animal kingdom filled with hostile creatures with dimensional energy levels above 700. Suyoung was taken aback by this information. The planet was a place where battles for territory and survival never ceased until death, and to lead a group, one had to be at least U rank. Even when Suho became king, he had to face challenges for hundreds of years. Suyoung realized that if a bridge portal connected the planet and allowed unrestricted travel in both directions, it would turn into a warzone as they fought against hostile beings from another world with S-rank dimensional energy. She was puzzled when she discovered that Suho couldn't control the animals on that planet, even though he was its king. Suho explained that he is no longer the same person as he was before, and that the animals may kill him if they saw how weak he had become. Suyoung advised Suho to flee to the northeastern field as far from the city center as possible. Ding Su and Junho followed them as the space started to distort. Suyoung contacted Kim Mizo and informed her that the portal was about to form. An artillery brigade was quickly assembled near Suho's location. 
However, Suho soon realized that it was not the planet he had been on before, but just an ordinary portal door. Suyoung asked how he could be sure without using any equipment. Suho explained that he was certain as it felt different from the portal he had previously passed through. Suyoung remembered that the dimensional energy of the teleportation portal Suho went through was higher than that of a portal bridge. Reporters observed a signal of a dimensional crack as the Awakener's bureau arrived. The detection team approached Suho's group and began setting up measuring devices. They found that it was a level 4 dungeon, which relieved Kim Maizo and Suyoung. Suyoung informed Maizo of Suho's plan to check it out. Maizo informed the director, who was upset about the investment already made. Maizo suggested sending a detection team member with video memory to accompany them to determine if the dungeon is where Suho is from. The director believes that if a dungeon portal appears near someone who has just returned, then they are a dungeon returner. Maizo argues that Suho being an irregular is valuable in itself. The detection team discovered that the dungeon would collapse in 50 days, and Suyoung advised Maizo to recall the military unit. Suho was intrigued by the measuring device and found out it was costly, but the bureau offered to permanently lend it to them as a gift. Suho wondered why they were giving him such valuable items and was reassured that even though he was not a returner from another planet, the Korean bureau would never treat him unfairly. The bureau acknowledged that many nations are reaching out to Suho and reminded him that they consider him part of their family. The man claimed he was a national treasure, but Suho told him that he had not received messages from other countries. Ding Su approached Suho and informed him that the competition for him was intense overseas and that messages were being sent to him since they couldn't directly contact Suho. Suho asked how much they were offering, and Ding Su replied that it was over 5 billion won. Suho warned Ding Su that they shouldn't become slaves to money and that talking to someone is more valuable than 5 billion won. Ding Su agreed and said he would at least show Suho the offers, but warned that the countries might try to harm him if he didn't. Suho told Ding Su to tell them he ignored their offers. Suho's group was about to enter the portal, but an agent asked them to wait for the combat team. Suho declined, allowing only two people to accompany them. The agent expressed concern about their small group, but Suyoung reassured him to record everything properly. Beku also joined them. Upon entering the portal, Suho felt a sense of familiarity. Suyoung stopped them and warned that three monsters were ahead. The group prepared for battle, with Junho stepping forward, causing the agent to fear him. As Junho passed Suho, Suho put him to sleep and instructed Ding Su to wake him up and administer a sedative. Suyoung explained to the agent that Junho has an illness that causes him to go insane every time he wields a blade. Suho commanded everyone to stand back as the lizardman appeared and everyone prepared themselves. Suho attacked, and the agent began recording. He swiftly defeated the two lizardmen with a slash and the third with a stab, leaving the agent in awe of Suho's swift movements. Suho tasked Junho and Ding Su to gather the loot from the corpses and warned them that he will be sending them enemies. He ordered Bekgu to bring more foes for them to face. The agent was concerned about the possibility of hundreds of enemies approaching. Junho lost control and charged towards the enemies, throwing his knife to kill one and finishing off the second. A sneaky lizard approached Junho from behind, but Ding Su shot it with his crossbow. Junho delivered the final blow, and Ding Su cheered as he reached level 9. Meanwhile, a group of reporters blocked Kim Maizo from entering the Suho territory and asked her to confirm if the portal was a level 4. Maizo declined to answer, but the reporter correctly assumed it was and allowed her to pass. The reporters deemed it a wasted effort since Suho was a returner from a level 4 dungeon and instructed their team to pack up. The driver asked Maizo if it was okay for her to disclose classified information. Maizo replied that Suho was more important than the higher-ups playing with money and that if the news of Park Suho being a dungeon returner spreads, no country would approach him anymore. A combat team was preparing to enter the portal, but they were told to stand by. Kim Maizo informed the captain that they couldn't enter until Suho agrees to cooperate with them. The doctor was taken aback by the news of Suho being a level 4 dungeon returnee. However, after recalling Suho's story, he remembered the mention of a sea and noted that there should not be any in a level 4 dungeon. He speculated that a planet had disintegrated and turned into a dungeon. Meanwhile, Suho effortlessly killed multiple lizards and instructed them to collect loot. During their walk, they spotted a glittering rock, and Suho felt a sense of familiarity. Ding Su and Junho then discovered Korean writing on the stone. While they analyzed the writing, Suho went into a cave. Inside, they found the cave filled with Korean writing, causing everyone to be shocked. 
they read writings expressing a desire for mating, ending Sue, and the agent deemed the writer as immature and lustful. They also saw writings about the writer missing his parents and brother Junho. Junho then came across a writing that read, Park Suho was here. Suyoung asked if this was Suho's origin. Suho viewed his drawings and was reminded of his rival, Kuro. He read a note that stated it had been 30 years since the gorilla Jackie started a rebellion and the two would soon face a final battle where one of them would die. Ding Su found many incomplete knives, which were of comparable quality to an artifact. Suho abruptly ran outside, Ding Su blamed Minsu for offending him with his teasing. Suho climbed a mountain and was taken aback by the changes in the landscape. He wondered what had happened. Suyoung caught up with him and asked if this was where he used to reside. Suho was uncertain and felt something was not right. He pointed in one direction, stating that there used to be a snowy mountain, another direction used to have a grove and fruit trees, and another direction was where the sea used to be. Suyoung was startled. Suho told her about the Roaring Sea, a place one should never visit. She asked if he had written the notes, to which Suho confirmed, saying it was his way of holding on to memories of the civilized world. He had taken up writing when he arrived at the cave, where he lived while hiding from other animals. Even after he relocated, he returned often to write in his journal, so he wouldn't forget how to write. Suyoung inquired about the presence of the lizardmen, and Suho replied that they weren't always there. She then asked about his animal companions, and Suho informed her that the area was controlled by leopards, and they were not weak enough to leave because of the lizardmen. Suyoung pointed to the fog and told Suho that it marked the end of the dungeon, and they couldn't progress any further. Suho was confused by this. Suddenly, a large number of lizardmen appeared, and the rest of the group joined Suho and Suyoung. Suyoung was bewildered as to why the lizardmen were attacking all at once. They then spotted the lizard king. Suho recognized the skull the king was wearing and warned Suyoung to stay with the others before jumping towards the enemies. Meanwhile, Granny was feeding a pigeon when it suddenly lit up, surprising her. Suho transformed his arms into wings, dodging the king's spear and landing in front of him. He then fused with Beku and bit the king's neck as they both plummeted off the mountain and crashed violently to the ground. Suho's group was shocked, but Suyoung reassured them that he was not dead and instructed them to prepare for battle. Minsu and Junho threw rocks at the lizardmen, while Ding Su shot arrows from his crossbow. Suho overpowered the lizard king, punched him repeatedly and removed the skull he was wearing. He then asked about the whereabouts of the leopards. The lizard king didn't answer and weakly hit him in the head. Suho flew into a rage and took to the air. The group continued to fight the lizardmen when they saw Suho in the sky holding the lizard king. He threw the king at the horde of lizardmen scaling the mountain causing the mountain to collapse and the group to fall with the lizardmen. Suyoung stood up and confirmed that everyone was okay, and Suho told them the door was open. Kim Maizo and the captain were waiting outside the portal when Suho's group emerged. The captain observed Suho and thought he appeared weak. Maizo tried to greet Suho, but he transformed into a pigeon and flew away. Maizo asked about the recording, and Suyoung instructed Minsu to return to HQ with Maizo, but Maizo stopped her and informed her that she needed to come along. The mission to observe Suho was over, and she was being sent to support the northern Digu border. Suyoung was taken aback. Minsu reported the events in the dungeon to the director and the captain. The captain was frightened after witnessing Suho defeating the Lizard King. The director asked about the Lizard King's strength, and Minsu informed him that it was A rank, but Suho easily overpowered him. The director surmised that Suho's abilities are higher than S rank. Suyoung explained that Suho's dimensional energy is E rank, but his combat abilities are S plus rank. When he fuses with an animal, his strength varies but is estimated to be at least SSS rank. She also stated that Suho does not have a ceiling for his skills, unlike other Awakeners. The captain wondered if all irregulars are like Suho, and thought that if everyone who disappeared returned like Park Suho, their country would become a superpower. Meanwhile, Myungjin was leading a group of children to a shed with farm equipment, unaware that they were being watched. Suyoung and her group set off for the Digu border, where the soldiers reported that conditions were not good. Suyoung checked her phone while Suho slept, unaware of her call. Ding Su was surprised to see a large donation despite Suho's reveal as a level 4 dungeon returnee, as Junho asked about Myungjin's whereabouts. Suho dreamed of reuniting with friends, but instead encountered a swarm of lizardmen. He thought of his Red Wolf family, past battles, and wondered where his friends had gone, speculating they may have teleported due to fear of the lizards. Suho came down to eat, and at the table, he asked about Suyoung, 
calling her Blondie, but Ding Su realized that Suho doesn't know Su Young's name. Shocking Junho and Ding Su, Ding Su told him that her name was Choi Su Young. Junho told them that Su Young was dispatched to the country and said that she contacted him because Suho wasn't answering his phone. Junho also told them they needed to recruit more members to man the measuring device and for when the portal burst as they can't handle it with their current numbers. Suho asked about Myungjin, and Junho remembered the location of the elders and orphans in Seoul. Ding Su tried calling Myungjin, but he didn't answer. Meanwhile, Su Young's group reached the Necroville Redzen and was told to turn off their communication devices. Su Young sighed and turned off her phone, while Suho saw her missed calls and tried calling back, but couldn't reach her. Kim Mizo and the captain came to see Suho, and Mizo told him they wanted to learn the secret behind his abilities in the dungeon. Suho insisted that it just requires hard training for a thousand years. The captain was angry, accusing Suho of being selfish, and demanded he help the country in its crisis. The captain explained that the frequency of level 6 dungeons was increasing, the time limit until they broke was shortening, and the number of infected people had surged, putting pressure on the city due to food and manpower shortages. The captain continued, saying that people with strong abilities like Suho were desperately needed. Suho asked about the infected people, and Maizo explained that after a cataclysmic change, an unknown virus spread among those living in the fields. The first infected person was a man named Bill, found in North America. The infected, called necrovals, are neither alive nor dead and indiscriminately attack and infect others. Maizo showed Suho where the necroval redzins were located and warned that if their numbers increased, it would become more difficult to transport via land routes and prevent dungeons from occurring in the fields. She thinks it's an alien virus that entered through a portal and spreads fast, making it hard for them to handle with their current resources. In exchange for allowing inspection and hunting in the dungeon, they will give Suho two gifts. Upgrading his guild level to 5 and a territory near his current one. She asks if he can protect the east of Seoul from danger. After the disaster, people are moving to safer areas due to necrovals and dungeon breaches, but big cities are full. Suho asks if he should move to Jiangi Du and take in refugees. She says that people gathering can help rebuild the city by developing commercial districts and clearing farmland. If Suho's guild proves their ability to manage the territory, they'll earn huge profits. She suggested using mobile modular houses in the commercial district in case of a portal break, as a long break time would bring great profits to the guild. Suho thanked her and asked about North Korea's situation. The captain informed him that their command system was severely damaged at the start of the disaster, causing the survivors to move around aimlessly, as they can't manage dungeons systematically, and breaches occur everywhere, and said it was only a matter of time before they flee to the south. Suho accepted and signed the contract after verifying that the 100-day residency requirement had been lifted. He asked to meet the inventor of the dimensional energy measuring device and to locate Myungjin's phone, as he wasn't answering. She agreed. Jeshik was waiting in line for an interview at the Shilla Guild Mercenary Recruitment. The Shilla Guild is a highly sought-after mercenary group established by the largest conglomerate in Korea, Shilla Corporation. The recruitment opens only twice a year and has a tough application process, but successful candidates receive extensive support. Despite the difficulties, Jeshik applied with high hopes and was surprised to pass the initial stage. This recognition of his skills came after three years of working for smaller clans and as a freelance mercenary. Jeshik was anxious, as he was aware that only 10 out of 50 who passed the preliminary round would be selected after the interview. Despite recognizing that this was a rare chance, he received a shocking message. In the interview room, the interviewer expressed disappointment in the mediocre candidates, but the captain was drawn to Jeshik's resume and decided to hire him. However, when the next batch was called, Jeshik was missing. One of the other applicants reported that he suddenly left. The message Jeshik received was from Suho, inviting him to join their guild and providing an address. As he fled, Jeshik realized that he didn't need to think it over, as Suho had saved his life and was the most talked about figure in Korea. In the following scene, a military convoy was being trailed by a swarm of necrovals. One of the soldiers commented that the roads were becoming hazardous and they should have stayed on the safer route. Another soldier responded that they had no option as they would arrive late if they didn't take this road. Suddenly, they saw a horde of necrovals devouring a monster and blocking their path. The soldier commanded to fire, but the other soldier was wary of agitating the necrovals. The first soldier insisted, pointing out that they were close to the Dabang Aerial Military Operations Area. 
They shot their weapons, aiming to drive away the necrobles. The soldiers' attacks successfully defeated the monsters blocking their path, but in doing so, they drew the attention of the surrounding necrobles, who charged at them. The soldiers fired as they retreated. Meanwhile, Myungjin's group, being pursued by the necrobles, searched for a place to hide. The monk apologized, as he was responsible for suggesting they go to the area and was unaware of the Necrobal invasion. Myungjin comforted him, prioritizing escape with the children. They found a building, and Myungjin instructed everyone to get ready. Just as they disembarked from the car, the Necrobals caught up. Myungjin stepped forward to block the incoming horde, even though his skills were still on cooldown. Suddenly, fairies appeared and decimated the horde with multiple tornadoes. Myungjin and his group were surprised to see Suho standing on top of the building, who warned them to step back to avoid being sucked into the tornadoes. Suho then summoned more tornadoes, sending all the necrobals soaring into the air. Suho smiled at the success of his skill. The soldiers were fighting off the necrobals when one of the vehicles overturned and became surrounded by the creatures. Suyoung, in another vehicle, checked the cameras and was surprised to see a necrobal on the screen. She ordered the door opened and devised a plan to head to Team 7's car. They stepped out, and Suyoung quickly dispatched the necrobals blocking their way. When one necrobal attacked her, she swiftly cut it in half and killed the rest surrounding her. Her team checked the overturned vehicle and found the driver dead, while the other was trying to open the rear door. They were being overwhelmed as one member cried that they would die if the situation continued. They prepared for close combat as the horde closed in, but suddenly an explosion killed the necrovals advancing towards them. The soldiers saw reinforcements arriving and landing nearby. Suyoung was still fighting when one of the reinforcements approached her, she recognized him as Sun Jin Woo. One of the reinforcements instructed the soldiers to duck as he prepared to attack, and while Jin Woo shielded Suyoung, he fired, wiping out the surrounding necrovals. Meanwhile, the necrovals that Suho had sent flying were falling to the ground and being killed. The children cheered as they saw the monsters being defeated. Myungjin asked how Suho had found them, and as he was introducing Suho to his group, one of the necrovals managed to bite him in the ankle. Suho witnessed this happening. In Japan, a portal opened in the middle of the city and a monster was destroying the area, causing the people to panic. A woman fell over and sent her baby stroller to the streets, but Akita Hiro arrived and caught the stroller while his team fought the monster. Hiro attacked and killed the monster with multiple slashes, cutting it into pieces. The people cheered as Hiro walked away. In the car, Akiko informed Hiro about Suho being just a dungeon returnee, he was satisfied knowing that he was right and not making a big deal about Suho, but then he saw the photo of Suho's group and recognized someone as the eighth evil it was Junho's son Gunwoo. He was certain of it and thought the child should be in an orphanage now after he lost his father, which is why he put him at the end of his assassination list the worst villain that originated from Korea. Hiro wondered why is he there. He recognized another person in Suho's group it was Jeshik, and he remembered him as the Hell Swordsman, Swordmaster Jang Jeshik. Followed by Myungjin who will be known as the Undying Destroyer, Buddhist Master. He was shocked to see those people gathered in one place. Akiko then showed him Suho's fight with the Lizard King which shocked him. Akiko thought that Suho was too strong for someone who returned from an F-rank dungeon, Hiro agreed. She continued that the articles saying that Suho is an irregular like him might be true. Hiro was concerned as to why an irregular like Suho, who he was unaware of, had appeared. He believed that Suho might be a regressor like him, gathering notorious villains to alter the future. This could potentially jeopardize the plan that Hiro had been working on for the past 500 years. When Akiko noticed Hiro's unease, he shared his worry with her. Hiro felt the need to go to Korea to meet Suho, but Akiko informed him that he cannot do that at the moment. Meanwhile, the children were in awe of the animals and vegetable garden, while Myungjin was speaking with the contractor. Maizo received news about the Suho clan's dungeon activity and was shocked at their fast clear speed, estimating they could finish a dungeon in just four days. Maizo felt overwhelmed and thought that they should have placed restrictions on the number of raids. Meanwhile, Jang Jeshik was showcasing the blade that Suho had given him, and he vowed to attain a B-rank status as soon as possible, while expressing his gratitude to Suho. Myungjin also approached Suho, asking for a favor. He was in need of a new weapon as his damage output was insufficient, and he wanted a wing spear. However, due to his low level, he couldn't purchase one. Suho bought the spear for him, and Myungjin thanked Suho profusely, promising to repay the debt through countless curses and massacres.
the Kiko informed Hiro that they couldn't travel due to the air and sea routes being blocked off due to a wyvern nest outbreak. Hiro was surprised by this news, but then received a call from the minister, saying he had to go to Hokkaido immediately for a level 7 dungeon appearance. Akiko pointed out that according to Hiro's prediction, this was not supposed to occur for another five months. Hiro realized that the events have accelerated, and if the level 7 dungeon couldn't be contained, it would cause a worldwide crisis. This troubled Hiro, as it would prevent him from adequately preparing for what was to come. Hiro believed that the only factor that had changed was Park Suho, and was confident that those close to Suho would also possess great talents in the future. He believed there was only one regression stone, and that perhaps Suho had regressed from a future further ahead in time than he himself was from. Hiro believed that Suho was aware of his own existence and future, and felt the need to meet him soon. If Suho's intentions were different from his own, Hiro was prepared to kill him for the sake of mankind. He told Akiko of his decision to first go to Hokkaido. Inside the dungeon, Suho asked Myungjin for an area taunt, and Myungjin obliged as Ding Su encouraged him to go louder. The group prepared for battle as they heard the approaching monsters. The lizardmen arrived, and Suho summoned his spirits, using a tornado to send the monsters into the air. Ding Su sniped the lizards, earning points easily. Another group of lizards charged, but Myungjin used Dragon Rush, killing many of them. The lizardmen sent flying by Suho began to fall, and Junho charged forward as Ding Su called out to the stunned Jeshik. The fallen lizardmen stood and were killed by Junho and Ding Su. One lizardman managed to get close and attack Ding Su, but Jeshik stopped it by chopping off its head. As they continued to kill the monsters around them, Jeshik reflected that no other guild would take an E-rank mercenary to level up in a level 4 dungeon for training. Suddenly, a lizard king appeared beside Jeshik, and Junho attacked it from behind, cutting off one of its arms. Jeshik delivered the final blow by chopping off its head, surprising himself with how easily he was able to kill it. Ding Su felt regret as they had to leave behind the blood crystal, as they needed to exit the dungeon, because the boss was dead. Jeshik apologized, and they all ran towards the exit. As they were running, Myungjin felt pain from a bite from the necrobal. The captain's team was investigating the dungeon and found nothing unusual, so they moved on to the next area. The base camp informed them that lizard spearmen were approaching, and the captain ordered two of his members to handle it. He asked for the location of the lizard king. At the base camp, one of the agents spotted something, but then saw the lizard king above them. The captain's group saw the explosion and received a report that the base camp had been breached by the enemy and was now under attack. The captain quickly ran to the base camp, defeated the lizard men blocking their path, and instructed everyone to retreat back to the base. At the same time, Jin Wu informed Su Young that they received an Sos while en route to Jiangbik. Su Young told Jin Wu that they were scheduled to meet with the CDC. Jin Wu informed her that there had been two level 5 dungeon breaches in the field, and the entire CDC was on the move. He offered to escort them until they could meet up with the 2nd Armored Brigade. Suddenly, one of the helicopters was hit by a fireball from a monster. The soldier informed Kim Maizo that the video was sent by a member of the special force with a video recording skill to the CDC. Kim Maizo was incensed at the person who put everyone in danger by driving through a necroval red zone and threatened to kill them herself if they returned alive. She tried calling Su Young, but there was no answer. At the captain's base camp, one of the soldiers had their arms cut off by the Lizard King and jumped on them but both were killed when the soldier detonated a bomb. The Lizard King's head fell in front of the captain and their group as the door opened, causing the captain to curse and feel humiliated. Kim Maizo was informed of the situation and found it unbelievable that they suffered so many casualties in a level 4 dungeon raid. She asked if any clues were found, and the agent reported that there was no clue related to the item. They confirmed that time in the dungeon was moving twice as fast as outside. Kim Maizo thought about Suho, who returned after 10 years, meaning he spent 20 years in the dungeon. However, they already confirmed that Suho's story about being there for 1,000 years wasn't a lie, and if the time in the dungeon was doubled, 500 years would have passed on Earth. Kim Maizo wondered how that happened. She ordered the expansion of the scouting party and to pick up the pace as Suho's team was clearing the dungeons too quickly. The agent reported that the Suho team had ceased trading after approximately seven hours with 50 successful clears and was currently on the way to the bureau to have their Awakener cards updated. In the car, Ding Su and Myungjin were asleep, except for Jeshik, who Suho asked if he was tired. Jeshik replied that everything felt like a dream. 
He had worked hard for 14 years and never reached a level 3 dungeon, yet on the first day with the Suho Guild, he had raided a level 4 dungeon 50 times and killed lizard warriors that were on the same level as bosses in level 1 and 2 dungeons. Despite barely becoming an ear ank after struggling for 3 years, he was now a deer ank. He noted that if he had joined the Shilla Guild, he would likely still be receiving rookie training. Upon arriving at the bureau, Suho realized that the higher his level, the more clearly he could hear the voices during measurement. Kim Mizo informed him that the creator of the energy measuring device was Dr. Toddler from England, and she had requested permission to visit and would inform Suho once she received a reply. Suho planned to leave immediately once he received permission. Ding Su congratulated Suho after seeing his dimensional energy was above C rank. Suho wondered if he was the only one who could see others' information, as he noticed that his group had just found out his level. He asked the doctor who created the status window system, and she replied that there was a legend among engineers called the God Stone. After the great disaster, it was a core item that revolutionized the dimensional energy industry. Suho and his group had never heard of it before. The doctor explained that after the great disaster, a large pillar of rock with red writing appeared in Northern Europe. It was discovered that Northern European Awakeners could see the status window after the rock appeared on Earth. People who suffered through the great disaster worshipped it, claiming that the writings on the pillar were God's revelations. After the revelations were deciphered, pieces of the pillar were spread throughout the world by different ministries, allowing all Awakeners around the world to see their stats through the status window. The piece of the rock pillar that was used to create the Bureau's dimensional computer, also known as the Godstone, is the CPU of the Bureau's dimensional computer and allows the management of the Awakener's status window. Suho asked what the deciphered content was, and the doctor told him that it contained general information used by Awakeners, like the upgrade system and the use of dimensional energy. As they left the Bureau, they discussed the amount they earned from raiding the dungeons that day. Ding Su suddenly remembered that he may soon be assassinated because he received donations from different countries. Junho wondered why they were still focusing on Suho, even though he had already proven to be a dungeon returnee. Ding Su explained that the messages praised Suho's ability to control plants, as the reduction of land occupied by humans has led to the need to import most of the world's food from planet Aruka, but with Suho, the food crisis could be solved. Suho asked why Ding Su would be assassinated, and Ding Su said it was because he was given money to talk to Suho, but wasn't delivering, and they feared if Suho didn't show up in two days, they would kill Ding Su. Suho asked what he needed to do, and Ding Su said he needed to deliver a message directly to the sponsors through a video right now. Suho agreed, and they recorded the message quickly so they could eat. Ding Su set it up and introduced Suho, who then said, I am not going, before standing up and leaving. Ding Su immediately received a message from an organization in Japan, asking to visit Suho for a serious conversation. Suho said it was fine for them to come, and Junho asked which country had sent the message. Ding Su assumed it was from Japan. In the meantime, the director of the DGB was notified of Suho's actions and the possibility of him entering the same dungeon where a previous incident occurred. The director was considering using a famous person to attract Suho to their side. The chairman called the director and questioned his actions, instructing him to return immediately. The director reassured the chairman that he was doing something beneficial for their group and intended to recruit Park Suho. The chairman reprimanded him, saying that the general manager had already been sent. The celebrity, Sanji, contacted the director expressing interest in meeting Park Suho. The director informed her that he was on his way to pick her up. While a group of armed individuals were searching for someone in a field, they noticed a man using a drone and ordered him not to move. Upon discovering the man was surrounded by goblins, the group chose to save him. The man shot one of the goblins, then ran away as the others pursued him, but tripped and dropped his gun. Just as a goblin was about to attack the fallen man, it was shot down by the armed group. The group then introduced themselves as the X-team of DGB and instructed the man to surrender. They reported to another individual that they had secured the target and were ordered to store it in the warehouse. Meanwhile, the director was angry with his assistant for not holding on to Suho until he arrived. The assistant explained that Suho had ignored him and entered the dungeon. The director asked how long it took for Suho to come out last time and was informed it took 4 days, 11 hours, and 27 minutes for two people to emerge. The director was frustrated as he believed they had to wait 8 days for Suho's return. In the dungeon, Suho stood atop a pile of dead orcs. 
he checked his status window and found he needed three more points to open the beast farm. However, he sensed that there was one more orc that was still alive, so he used tracking and found the orc. Suho dashed to the orc and delivered the final blow, earning 23 achievement points. He opened the beast farm and chose a location for it. The information about the beast farm was displayed, and Suho saw there was one hybrid and believed it to be Beku. Another group of orcs charged at Suho, and a message prompted him to input a summoning command. After some thought, Suho summoned all his wolves, intent on filling his beast farm to capacity. The director received a call informing him that Suho had already emerged from the dungeon, which the director found unbelievable, as Suho had only entered a few hours prior. The assistant continued, saying that Suho had gone back in and come out a second time after only two hours. The director still had his doubts and called Sanji. Meanwhile, inside the dungeon, Suho continued to fight the orcs. A barrage of arrows was shot in their direction, and Suho ordered his wolves to retreat. Some of the arrows hit the orcs, but his wolves retreated safely. Suho transformed wings on his back as the orcs shot arrows at him, flew inside the castle, and used a tornado to block the orcs. The orc lord jumped down in front of Suho and merged with one of the wolves. Suho attacked the orc lord, hitting it in the face and knocking it down, then lifted the orc lord into the air with a tornado. Suho followed and delivered a kick that sent the orc crashing back to the ground. He then dropped down violently and finished it off. Suho ran to the wolf pen and used his taming skill, then sent the wolves to the beast farm. After emerging from the portal, Suho felt the side effects from merging and realized that if he entered one more time, he could fill all 100 spots in the beast farm. However, Sanji approached him. As Sanji approached Suho, the media was already buzzing with rumors of their supposed relationship. The director was thrilled to hear that Sanji had made contact with Suho and rushed to his location. Upon arriving, he found Sanji crying and asked where Suho was. She told him that Suho had left after a drink and said he didn't like her because she was weak. Enraged, she stood up and decided to awaken. The director and his assistant were talking when they saw Suho emerge from the dungeon. The director ran over to try and introduce himself, but Suho quickly returned to the dungeon, causing the director to become angry. However, he was stopped by Chief Secretary Chien. The director was told to rest while the secretary took over. The secretary informed the chairman that Suho's abilities were more powerful than they had anticipated. Suho looked at the stats for the beast farm and saw that it was already filled and that at level 2, its capacity would increase to 200. He decided to call it a day. The chief secretary introduced himself as Qian Dimying from the DGB group and apologized for a past accident. He invited Suho to a meal, which he accepted. After eating, the secretary offered Suho a gift. When Suho asked what the DGB wanted from him, the secretary explained that they wanted to partner with the Suho Guild. The DGB Guild has yet to rise to a position where it can represent one of Seoul's 12 sectors because they haven't formed a level 6 combat team. Suho replied that he had no interest in becoming one of the representing guilds of Seoul's 12 sectors. The secretary responded that their aim was not to be one of the 12 representing guilds in Seoul, but rather to establish a 13th sector with the Suho Guild. He explained that like the 12 sectors in Seoul, if there is a level 6 guild stationed in a particular area, a city will form around it. However, the guilds within the 12 sectors are struggling to handle level 6 dungeons, causing anxiety among the citizens. If a 13th guild, which can provide peace of mind, is established, people will start moving to the 13th sector, and the value of land will skyrocket. The secretary was confident that the Suho guild was capable of fulfilling the citizens' hopes. However, there was a challenge that the Suho Guild couldn't overcome on its own. They lacked the resources, manpower, and experience to create and manage a city by themselves. The tasks included raiding dungeons, managing dungeons, planning and building the city, all while working with the government and negotiating with various companies. Suho understood that DGB had the financial and experiential resources but not the strength, and they wanted to partner with the Suho Guild to lend their power. The secretary saw an opportunity to invest in the Suho Guild and asked if they could accomplish it with just their current members. He assured Suho that DGB would be the best partner for the Suho Guild. Suho suspected that DGB wanted control over the construction of residential and commercial areas around the dungeons, but he agreed with what the secretary had said. Suho requested time to think about it. As he stood up to leave, the secretary informed him of another gift, which was difficult to obtain. 
The gift was the president of the Yungari Loan Company, who was on the wanted list and had fled to the fields. The secretary offered to have him taken care of, but Suho declined, telling the secretary to do as they pleased. However, Suho then remembered something and called Junho. He instructed Junho to go to the given address as someone wanted to see him. Suho told the secretary that his younger brother would take care of it. Junho arrived at the designated spot and was directed to a container. Inside, he found the president of the Yungari Loan Company. The loan shark asked about Suho's presence, and Junho replied that he wasn't there. The loan shark chuckled and expressed regret for hitting him, to which Junho forgave him. The loan shark then shifted blame to the bureau and the DGB for scamming Suho into the level 5 dungeon. Junho was ready to leave, but the loan shark stopped him, seeking his help in getting out. The loan shark mentioned that he lent Junho money and found work for Gunwoo's mother when they were in need. Upon hearing about Gunwoo's mother, Junho paused. The loan shark explained that he used to run the Yungari Employment Center and remembered her coming to him, desperate for work. The truth of the situation was revealed. The loan shark and his accomplices went to Junho's home to collect payment, but he was not there. They then offered a contract to sell the organs of Junho's family member and warned that if Junho was absent the next time they visited, they would take her instead. Junho inquired about what happened, and the loan shark revealed that she begged for mercy while holding Gunwoo. Junho asked where she was and the loan shark promised to take him to her if Junho agreed to help him. Meanwhile, Suho received a message from Kim Maizo, saying that a response had come from Dr. Toddler, and he agreed to meet Suho in England. Suho was thrilled at the prospect of meeting the doctor, who might know about the connection between the time mix-up, the dimension crack, and the planet he was on. He hoped to find a way to reunite with his brothers. Concerned about Junho, Suho tried calling him but received no answer. He instructed his driver to take him to the DGB container. When Junho and the loan shark arrived at the designated location, the loan shark assured Junho that his men would take him to his wife. However, they were surrounded by armed thugs as the loan shark greeted his men. One of the thugs recognized Junho and taunted him. The loan shark informed the group that Junho was searching for his wife and ordered them to take him to her. They led him into a building and flipped on the lights, revealing a blood-filled grinder. The thugs discussed which grinder they used on Junho's wife. Junho asked about his wife's whereabouts, but was suddenly attacked by the lone shark, falling to the ground. The lone shark admitted to grinding Junho's wife in the meat grinder, while mocking him for being an ineffective husband. The lone shark continued to beat Junho with a bat, blaming Suho for the downfall of his business. Junho endured the beating as memories flooded back. After high school, playing gore games was his only escape, then he met his future wife Mijing. When they had a baby, Junho was playing games while his wife cried in secret. He believed the only gift he could offer her was the hysteria of someone fleeing poverty and reality. One of the criminals informed the head that the grinder was prepared. Exhausted from beating Junho, the loan shark told Junho to go see his wife. Junho believed that if he saw her again, he would plead for another chance. The leader instructed to shatter Junho's ankles, as they did to his wife, and then slowly lower him into the grinder head first. A criminal raised a sledgehammer to strike, but Junho thanked them for reminding him of the past and stated he deserved the pain, but he felt nothing. Junho then swiftly attacked, severing the arm of the thug holding the sledgehammer. The criminals were taken aback. Junho declared that after his wife left, he had promised not to engage in such actions, but he couldn't allow individuals like them to live while smiling. The criminals fled as they realized Junho was an awakener. The leader was sliced into pieces, petrified with fear. Junho pursued the remaining criminals and continued his massacre. The thugs wondered where their snipers were, but they had already been dealt with by Suho. Suho then ordered the men from DGB to clean up the aftermath to avoid any future problems. DGB representatives assured that many of these individuals had their social security numbers revoked, making it unlikely that the government would pay attention to them. Suho was pleased to see Junho as an awakener. Meanwhile, reports indicated that despite the ongoing danger posed by the frequent dungeon breaches in the Jiangpik Digu region, the area appeared to be becoming safer, with the aid of special forces from Seoul, Busan, and Gwangju provinces. However, the belief that the guilds alone were struggling to contain the rapid increase in dungeons was causing citizens to become increasingly anxious. The soldiers cheered for the most powerful combat team in Korea, the Special Forces 707A, Black Cloud, the next news was about the scandal regarding Sanji and Suho's relationship. Suyoung was incensed upon hearing this. 
Kim Mizo was informed that they had increased the number of teams and the amount of loot, but they failed to find any information about a treasure she was searching for. Mizo realized she needed to focus more on Suho and not on the level 4 dungeon. She received a call from Suho thanking her, and he asked what would happen if an Awakener was bitten by a Necrobal. When asked if someone had been bitten, Suho denied it and claimed he was just curious. Mizo explained that there have been 38 cases of Awakeners infected by Necrobals. On the 48th day of observation, two died from sudden leukemia, 26 developed baldness, 7 experienced sporadic pain at the bite site but had no other effects, and 3 F ranks became necrovals. The symptoms include high fever, general body pain, and red corneas. It is recorded that the lower the level, the higher the chance of becoming a necroval. Suho confirmed that the bitten individual would be quarantined, and Mizo replied that they would be taken to the International Disease Control Center in Australia. Junho believed they would be experimented on. Suho then approached and greeted a vendor. The vendor recognized Suho and asked if he needed medicine for his brother. Suho replied that it was not for his brother, but for someone who had been bitten on the leg by a person with a disease. He asked if the vendor had any medicine that might work and mentioned that the previous medicine he got from the vendor had been effective. The vendor thought for a moment then handed him the medicine and provided instructions on how to use it. Suho bought 10 tins and thanked the man. The vendor added that if the patient started convulsing, they should knock them out and apply the medicine. Suho left and the police arrived, informing the vendor that it was illegal to sell in the area. The vendor fled as the police looked for him. Meanwhile, Myungjin was writhing in pain as Jeshik, Gunwoo, and Ding Su watched. Suho arrived with the medicine and knocked out Myungjin to administer it, who had become frenzied. In Japan, a crowd cheered as they watched Hiro Akita and his team emerge from a level 7 dungeon, but the celebration was short-lived as the team suddenly collapsed. Reports indicated that seven members of the team had not returned, leading to concern about the difficulty of a level 7 dungeon, as the world's most powerful team had suffered seven casualties. At the hospital, Hiro regained consciousness and was comforted by Akiko. She informed him that Suho had invited Mr. Daigo, second in command of the Supernatural Bureau, which is responsible for national defense and holds a higher prestige than the Awakener Federation. Hiro suspected that the government was trying to get in touch with Suho and was angry that he was being used as a benchmark to create a better future. He blamed Suho for ruining his plans and believed that he was gathering criminals for some nefarious purpose. Hiro swore that he must kill Suho in order to secure his own and humankind's future. He then instructed Akiko to find a boat to go to Busan immediately. Meanwhile, Suho was speaking with a monk, who expressed gratitude for Suho's help in building a temple in his territory. Suho was informed that Myungjin was recovering well, able to exercise in the morning and eat properly. Myungjin shared with Suho about how he met his master and how the temple burned down, resulting in his master's death. This event evoked hatred in Myungjin for the first time, causing him to take lives with his own hands. He felt that even if he became an Asura and faced damnation in the end, it was worth it, as long as he could rid himself of the resentment in his heart. A fellow monk saved Myungjin from falling into the abyss, as he would have otherwise died in a dungeon. Myungjin told Suho that he saved him and helped rebuild the burned-down temple, allowing him to lay down the burden in his heart. He pledged to walk the path of an Asura alongside Suho. Meanwhile, Hiro arrived in Busan by boat with the intention of meeting Suho. Junho informed him that Secretary Chien from the DGB had called and reported that they had completed the city plans using the drafts provided by Suho. Suho instructed Junho to ensure the quality of work was up to par and mentioned that he would be leaving for England soon, but Ding Su informed him that air and ship routes were closed due to the Wyvern dungeon. Junho suggested that Suho fly there, to which Suho replied that if he transformed into a pigeon, he could only fly for 10 minutes. They learned that the experts estimated it would take China a month to eliminate the monsters, but Suho did not want to wait that long. Ding Su proposed finding an awakened golden eagle and taming it, and according to a video, there was a large golden eagle north of the DMZ. Meanwhile, Sun Gu and Akiko were traveling to Seoul. Akiko reminded him that if his location was disclosed, it would create a major problem, and suggested bringing Suho into the spotlight like the SFC. Sungwu responded that he couldn't wait any longer and considered assassination as the most straightforward solution. Suho and Ding Su arrived at the location and searched for a while, but they still couldn't find the golden eagle they were looking for. Suho called Su Young and asked for her help to locate the eagle, but she cursed at him and hung up. They then noticed a group of starfish flying in the distance. 
Ding Su showed Suho a report of a starfish dungeon break and explained that they exploded and burned down their surroundings, even when they were killed. Ding Su and Suho were in the forest when suddenly a flock of birds flew by. Ding Su saw that the fire was spreading and suggested they leave. All the animals in the area were also fleeing the blaze. They spotted a golden eagle flying with the birds, and Suho was thrilled as he had tamed it. Later, a news report came out about the wildfire in Gangwindu and stated it was extinguished by a local updraft caused by the starfish. Ding Su knew this was false and uploaded a video showing a boar charging through the fire and using a tornado to put it out. He edited out the part where Suho passed out after using his white area skills. Ding Su was then contacted by Jeshik and Junho to go on a level 2 dungeon raid. Before leaving, he uploaded a clip of Suho transforming into an eagle and flying to England. Akiko discovered a video that Suho left for London and told Sunwoo about it. Upon watching the video, Sunwoo believed that Suho was purposely avoiding him and was defensive towards him. He resolved to confront Suho before he completed his preparations, using provocation as a means to do so. While flying, Suho realized he couldn't increase his speed. He checked his skill tree and saw that he could unlock fire attribute skills, including fire fairies, fire stream, and twin fire stream. A warning then appeared indicating that the time for fusion was running out. Below, two men were hunting a bull. They fired at it, but the bull continued to run. Suddenly, something fell from the sky in front of the bull, causing it to take flight. The two men were taken aback, with one being curious and the other only focused on bringing the bull back home. Suho emerged from the hole, causing the men to become cautious. The men questioned Suho as he introduced himself, with one of them, Kim Chul Yeong, introducing himself as well. Suho asked about their location, to which Chul Yeong explained they were in Sinuju. The men believed Suho to be a strong awakener, due to his survival after falling from the sky. The older man asked if Suho had any companions, to which Suho replied that he did but was currently alone. The older man urged Suho to continue his journey and that they would handle the bull. Suho searched for his phone but found it to be broken, while the men discovered that the bull had already died and were about to cut it into pieces for easier transport but stopped at Suho's request for a blood crystal phone. Chul Yeong had one, but the older man warned of the dangers of bringing an awakener back to the village as there were women and children there. Suho picked up the dead bull, surprising the two men. He offered to help them carry it in exchange for their phone. The two whispered to each other, with Chul Yeong pointing out that they needed to bring the bull back or they would face starvation. The older man reminded him of what awakeners had done to their village the previous year when they had arrived as nomads but later brought in their companions and plundered the village. Suho urged the men to go and they told him to follow. The older man had plans to leave Suho behind, thinking that he couldn't keep up while carrying the bull. They felt regret that they have to leave the bull and they sped up, but they were surprised as Suho ran alongside them. They arrived in the village, and the people were surprised to see Suho carrying the bull. The older man was named Zhang Xiong, he asked why the gate was broken, and one of the villagers informed them some of the villagers went out to rescue He Yin and said that a winged beast suddenly appeared, it shot fire everywhere and killed people causing panic. Zhang Ming had everyone heard for the shelters, but He Yin fell and was taken by the monster. Zhang Xiong asked where the monster had taken He Yin, they informed him that the monster went over the rocky mountain, Zhang Xiong immediately left on his motorbike, as Chul Yeong asked for Suho's help. Suho's told him to lend him their phone when he comes back and flew toward the mountain. Meanwhile, the men who came to rescue He Yin were being attacked by a giant bear. One of the group members was swiped and sent flying by the bear. The group charged at the bear but were overpowered by it. The bear approached the leader, but Suho appeared, kicking the bear away. The group was surprised and questioned who he was, to which Suho replied that he was helping Chul Yeong. He asked where He Yin was, and Zhang Ming told him she was taken to the winged creature's nest on the mountain. Suho noticed one man was severely injured and gave him a potion. Suddenly, the bear appeared behind Suho, but he kicked it multiple times, causing it to fall over. Knowing the bear was only playing dead, Suho ordered it to get up and follow him. The bear immediately sat in front of Suho, and he named it Ilgam. He saw that it had been dethroned by the winged creature, and it made the bear upset. Suho asked the bear to lead him to the winged creature for his revenge, and the bear roared excitedly in response. Zhang Xiong arrived, and Suho informed them of his plan to bring the child back and for them to fulfill their promise. Suho then left with the bear and flew towards the mountain. 
Meanwhile, in a cave, a hurt dragon was eating while he and cowered in fear. Ilgam and Suho arrived and attacked the dragon. Suho merged with the bear and saw the monster's information, discovering it was a wounded wyvern. The wyvern bit Suho's arm, but he defeated it by smashing it to the ground and throwing it out of the cave. Suho instructed he and to remain still, and he considered if he could tame the wyvern, since its dimensional energy was higher than his. He then received a message about wyvern taming, stating that if the beast's dimensional energy is 100 points higher, it can be tamed if its constitution is below 10. Ilgam's emotions suddenly overwhelmed Suho, and he punched the wyvern, causing it to fall off the mountain and reducing its constitution to 16%. Suho struggled to control himself and continued to attack, Suho tried to stop the attack, but it still connected sending the wyvern flying. Realizing that he shouldn't kill the wyvern, Suho cancelled the fusion spell and sent Ilgam back. The falling wyvern hit the rocks, causing its health to deteriorate further. But Suho tamed and healed the wyvern, restoring its health. Suho then mounted the wyvern and took flight. When the villagers saw the winged creature approaching, they prepared for battle, but their leader recognized Heian and Suho riding the wyvern, and the villagers stood down. Suho and Heian landed and were greeted with a celebration from the villagers. They shared a meal together and watched as the wyvern played with the children. Through taming the wyvern, Suho saw its past and learned that it was part of a group of wyverns that were nearly destroyed by a Chinese and Russian alliance. The wyvern had been flying far behind the group, which allowed it to escape the battle. Despite successfully fleeing the battlefield, the wyvern was in pain and suffering from hunger when it stumbled upon the village and took the child. It then discovered Ilgum's cave, which was filled with the bear's food supplies. The villagers expressed their gratitude to Suho and explained their situation. Before the great disaster caused the government to collapse and warlords gained independence, they lived a happy life, helping each other and treating each other like family. But as fighting became difficult, they were separated and forced to scatter. With survival becoming increasingly difficult, many people began to flee to the mainland. The population of nomadic individuals has declined due to a shortage of food sources, including prey and crops, and due to attacks from animals and looters. Suho inquired about the safety of the continent and was told that the vastness of the territory likely means that the number of dangers such as creatures and looters are not as concentrated as in their current location. They were informed, however, that there are protective barriers around Beijing that offer protection to its citizens. Refugees understand that surviving in a new land far from home, where they cannot speak the language and have no connections, will be a challenge. However, simply reaching that place alive is their only hope. Suho concurred and reflected on Kim Mizo's statement that the continuous loss of land to monsters is causing Asia to rapidly become a barren wasteland. They predicted that the refugees from the north will eventually become the responsibility of the Suho territory. Suho realized that if they were unable to protect their own group, they must seek out a stronger pack and ally with them for survival, but it would come at a cost. The villagers offered for Suho to spend the night, but he declined, stating that he needed to be on his way. The villager then gave Suho the phone he required, and Suho expressed gratitude and presented them with a cluster of red stones, telling them to use it for their future needs. Suho then mounted his wyvern and set off for England. In the following scene, a news report was shown about a swarm of wyverns that had terrorized the skies, causing widespread fear. The Russian and Chinese alliance, however, managed to destroy the wyverns above Mount Bektu. A video of a wyvern being controlled by an awakener was quickly circulated among witnesses, and the people rejoiced at the appearance of a dragon knight. A flash report then revealed a portal breach that occurred on Bampo Bridge, causing chaos as two fire ants emerged from the portal and caused the bridge to collapse. People on the scene recognized the person on the bridge as Lee Sunwoo, and news of his sudden appearance on Bampo Bridge caused a stir as people were curious about why he was in the country. News broke of the Dragon Knight joining the Russian tank force on a mission to defeat the Scorpion Monster. s rank tamer Sylvia arrived at Moscow airport, and taming awakeners were gathering in Siberia because of the Dragon Knight. People were curious about the identity of the Dragon Knight, and a subsequent report confirmed that he was Park Suho. In an interview, Lee Sungwoo claimed that Suho's abilities were fraudulent, and he had come to Korea to expose him. He added that Suho fled because he knew Lee Sungwoo was coming to Korea and was afraid of being exposed as a fraud. Lee also accused Suho of being a mere tamer, used by the government for financial gain. Lee Sungwoo then issued a challenge to Suho to prove himself on the SPFC stage. 
Ding Su and Jun Ho were confused about why Su Ho was in Russia, as they were aware that he was headed for England. The director then contacted them, inquiring about Su Ho, but they informed the director that they were unable to reach him. The director suggested that they construct a defensive wall, as Su Ho's territory had been designated as the 13th area of Seoul, and the bureau would manage the easier dungeons. The director hoped that the Suho Guild would join as the advance team in the event of a level 7 dungeon appearing. Junho replied that he was unable to make a decision on his own and needed to wait for Suho's return. Junho was uncertain about the feasibility of managing the responsibilities of being the 13th area and raiding level 7 dungeons simultaneously. He considered the prospect of being part of the advance team for level 7 dungeons as a high-risk proposition, as they would receive preferential treatment in exchange for risking their lives. However, he felt that it was unnecessary to take on such risks. Korea was in turmoil due to Lee sun wus challenge and the 13th area issue. Meanwhile, the doctor was en route to meet Suho and was speaking with him on the phone. The doctor asked for Suho's assistance in eliminating the golems that were pursuing him. Suho appeared riding on a wyvern and launched an attack on one of the golems, causing it to collide into nearby buildings. He then summoned fire fairies and used a fire tornado to attack the other golem. After landing, Suho finished off the remaining golem. Impressed, Dr. Toddler approached Suho and snapped a photo of him and the wyvern. Suho explained to the doctor that the Russians painted the wyvern to avoid mistaking it as an enemy. The doctor expressed gratitude, mentioning that he purchased the priciest translator when he heard Suho was coming. Suho asked if they were in London, observing the devastated state of the city. The doctor informed him that the situation in England, particularly in London, was dire and that it becomes even more hazardous after sunset. Suho commanded Biryong to return, and the doctor was captivated by the sight of the beast summoning portal. Meanwhile, people on Suho's territory were amazed to see a wyvern emerge from the portal. One person reassured them that the creatures at the beast farm were friendly. In the car, the doctor was pleased to see such a large creature entering the beast farm and assumed it was at level 3. The doctor continued to express his happiness in finally meeting Suho, but Suho suspected that the doctor intended to use him for experiments. The doctor informed Suho that England's new capital is New Dover and that his lab was located there. Suho questioned why they didn't just meet in New Dover, but the doctor explained that he had ventured out to collect materials for his research. He added that there had recently been a massive bombing in London, which allowed him to obtain ample tissue samples and blood crystals from the dead monsters. The doctor then revealed that he is currently exploring the feasibility of creating a permanent teleportation portal, similar to Suho's Beast Farm portal. The doctor speculated that the monster teleportation portals that appear from time to time likely function similarly and believed that if they could utilize this technique, even if monsters were to conquer the skies and seas, they could travel anywhere in the world in a matter of minutes. He acknowledged that the blockage of air and sea routes is a problem unlikely to be resolved in the near future and emphasized the importance of preparing beforehand to avoid being isolated and ensure continued survival for humankind. The doctor asked Suho the reason for their meeting, but their conversation was abruptly interrupted when the road in front of them exploded. They observed a humpback whale being attacked by a shark-like creature and fell into the water. A rescue team arrived at the scene, and one of its members recognized the doctor's car and said he would find the doctor. However, after diving underwater, the rescuer saw the car was already empty and the shark-like creature still pursuing the whale, but the whale continued to dodge the shark's attacks and leapt out of the water. The rescue team considered shooting, but stopped when they saw people on the whale's fin. Suho used a tornado to block the shark, and the rescue team recognized the skill as that of the Dragon Knights. Suho summoned his fire fairies and launched an attack on the shark while it was still in the air. The rescuers then opened fire once the whale was at a safe distance from the shark. The doctor was astounded by Suho's actions, while Suho engaged in conversation with the whale as they both landed back in the water. The shark hit the rocks and died, resulting in Suho leveling up and unlocking his water attribute skill. Suho and the doctor sat and watched the whale playing in the water. The doctor explained that whales are becoming extinct due to sea monster attacks and that the whale was lucky to have met Suho. Suho then mentioned that this town was at the edge of the world, and the doctor added that England has been pushed to the brink and has no more room to retreat. They are in the middle of building a protective wall. Suho then inquired about the dimension energy measuring device and asked about its principles. He explained that every time he was measured, he felt like someone was watching him. 
He asked about the planet he had returned from, which used to be a planet, but was now fragmented and appeared as a dungeon. The level 4 dungeon was only a portion of the land and was filled with lizards he had never seen before, instead of the animal friends who used to live there. Suho asked about his friends, why he hadn't aged in a thousand years, and who were the people observing him whenever he checked his dimensional energy with the device. Suho expressed his desire for answers to these questions to the doctor, who specialized in these topics. The doctor informed Suho that his questions and interest in the Korean language and Hangul are linked. The doctor then led Suho to his underground lab, which was built to withstand a nuclear bomb and is not accessible to anyone but him. The doctor showed Suho various devices and explained their functions. The doctor also displayed some drawings, which were pictures taken from dungeons over the past two months, and pointed out that they found Hangul and Earth languages within the dungeons. He showed Suho pictures of portals in their levels, including level 3 dungeons in Berlin, level 4 in Oslo, level 5 in Athens, 8 places in Europe, 2 in Africa, 3 in Asia, and the recent one in Korea, with a total of 4. Suho was puzzled by the different levels and wondered if it was because it was a dungeon, not a new planet. Suho posed the question about why the planets broke into fragments and were duplicated, to which the doctor responded that it was the most plausible theory about the source of dungeons. Suho then asked about the fate of the creatures residing on those planets, but the doctor was uncertain and expressed his own curiosity. He explained that this was the reason why he wanted to talk to Suho, as he hoped that by meeting him, he would uncover the truth behind the formation and collapse of dungeons, which has bewildered them and resulted in various theories being proposed. The doctor took hold of Suho's hand and emphasized his desire to understand this mystery. However, one day, the creator of Hangul that he had been eager to meet reached out to him. The doctor asked Suho to work with them to find the answers they sought. Suho was somewhat disappointed, as he believed the doctor didn't have any answers. The doctor then presented him with a memory stone and instructed him to place his hands on it and close his eyes. When Suho did so, he was immediately met with the feeling of being observed. He opened his eyes in surprise. The doctor explained that although there are variations, all highly sensitive awakeners have felt somewhat uneasy when using the memory stone. Suho questioned if the memory stone was the basis for the dimensional energy measuring device, and the doctor confirmed this to be true. The doctor further stated that they did not create the memory stone and that it descended from the sky during the disaster, along with the portals. The memory stone's purpose took some time to uncover, but the discovery of it and the god stone, which also fell during the disaster, led to the establishment of the dimensional industry. Although the great disaster caused severe damage in Europe, it was also seen as a blessing from a researcher's perspective. The doctor explained that thanks to the information stored in the memory stone, they were able to develop numerous devices, including the stone case. The memory stone can exchange information with anything it comes into contact with. The doctor asked Suho to place his hands on the device and was amazed to see that Suho's dimensional energy was B rank in just three months, Suho realized that it was a portable measuring device, which the doctor confirmed and planned to further miniaturize. The doctor also showed Suho another device created with the memory stone that can measure a person's physical information, such as strength and agility. This way, they can classify awakeners based not only on their dimensional energy, but also their physical abilities, allowing for more effective combat team. Suho confirmed that no awakener has been able to view not only their own physical attributes, but also those of others. The doctor then proposed that Suho test the device, but when Suho placed his hands on it, it malfunctioned and displayed an error. Suho asked the doctor about the origin of the memory stones, and the doctor informed him that they are mined from the planet Aruka. Meanwhile, Lee Sun-gu arrived at Suho's territory and met gun -woo. The doctor explained that memory stones are abundant in that area, comparing them to transmission devices, saying that the high elves of Aruka use them for communication across the planet. The doctor revealed information they obtained from some visiting elves from Aruka. They told the doctor that on Aruka, the high elves can use memory stones to view other people's dimensional energy level, class, and other important characteristics. Suho was shocked upon hearing this and wondered if the status window he sees is the same as that seen by the high elves. Suho tried checking the status window, but it suddenly glitches. The doctor then left to fix the device and said goodbye. Suho looked at the lab and saw reports on his writings and estimated that the author of the writings was at least 200 years old. He decided to go to Aruka as they may have information about the entity observing him and the secret surrounding the great disaster and the appearance of dungeons. 
The guide arrived, and Suho asked if he could reach the portal he was pointing to. The guide told him that it was the South Portal E101 in London, and asked if Suho wanted to participate in clearing the portal dungeon, to which Suho agreed. The doctor was perplexed after finding that the device was functioning properly, but it malfunctioned when Suho used it. An S-rank awakener named David came to see Suho, but the doctor informed him that Suho had already left and asked David to try the device, which worked fine. The doctor complimented David's high stats, to which David replied that one must have at least four digits to be considered impressive and said goodbye. The doctor then discovered that the device's limit was only 999, so he retrieved Suho's data and increased the limit of the device. The doctor was shocked by the result. Suho arrived at the location as the guide informed him that it was a level 5 dungeon filled with giant grasshoppers, and there were 18 hours left until the dungeon broke. They then saw a group of helicopters battling a monster on a screen, and the guide explained that more than half of the area was engaged in battles, but that this would not prevent them from raiding dungeons. Suddenly, a chopper crashed in front of them, sending debris flying their way, but Suho saved the guide from the flying metal. The people there recognized Suho as the Dragon Knight. The guide thanked Suho and informed him that the entry procedures had been taken care of and introduced him to the Lawrence Corporation as Phoenix Team, one of the best combat teams in England, who had been assigned to Suho as an air rank combat team. The leader introduced himself as Robert Cole, captain of the second Phoenix Team, but Suho walked past them and stated that he was going to raid the dungeon alone. The guide tried to stop Suho, but he had already entered the portal. The guide was concerned for Suho's safety. Then, David arrived and asked about the Dragon Knight. The guide informed David that Suho had entered the dungeon alone and expressed his worries. David chuckled and said he would be waiting and to let him know when Suho comes out. The guide and the Phoenix team were taken aback when Suho emerged from the dungeon. The Phoenix team was discussing the difficulty of the dungeon and considering giving up, but they were surprised to see Suho come out. David greeted Suho, but just then a fire boar charged at them. David swiftly defended by attacking the boar, sending it flying. David and Suho introduced themselves, and David expressed his desire to meet Suho because he saw how Suho defeated the shark monster and felt they were similar. David explained that he obtained his strength by eating a lot of bananas after seeing Suho's cave paintings. David did so and was eating bananas during his training. David then expressed his desire to see Suho fight a monster using only his strength, and Suho agreed. They entered the dungeon together and cleared a level 5 dungeon 15 times in 40 minutes just before a dungeon break. It was reported that the queen was expected to award Suho with knighthood. Meanwhile, Kim Maizo and the director were discussing how to bring Suho back to Korea, but Kim Maizo was confident that Suho would return after checking online and showing a video of Lee Sunwoo, causing a major disturbance. Suho was at a party and talking to David. David advised him not to be swayed by the champion's provocations, but Suho was confused. David informed him that Lee Sungwu had challenged him in an interview and referred to him as a psycho murderer. David explained that he fought and lost to Lee Sungwu and showed the damage Sungwu did to him. Many subsequent challengers died. David also informed Suho that Lee Sungwu killed even those who surrendered. Suho asked why, but David didn't have an answer. David advised Suho to stay away from Hiro. Suho then saw the news that Lee Sungwoo had attacked Suho's territory. Suho called Junho and was informed that Hiro had come and threatened to kill everyone if Suho didn't come out. Junho told Suho that two of the wolves had already died, and Suho became furious. He attempted to utilize the system, however, it remained ineffective, and he discovered that the alarms failed to notify him due to the error in the status window. David advised Suho not to go, and was certain that Hiro had a motive. He explained that for a champion to taunt an awakening that isn't even ranked yet, there was a high probability that something would happen. Suho disregarded David's advice and left anyway. He attempted to summon the wyvern, but failed. Meanwhile, the doctor was watching and was disappointed that Suho was leaving and wanted to keep him in the country longer. The system then returned and Suho saw the messages about the two wolves dying. The wyvern then arrived. The doctor was holding an artificial ore called Arukamite, and he deduced that Park Suho's abilities were the same as the High Elves, and that Park Suho's status window was probably not functioning properly after he touched the Arukamite. He further explained that after coming into contact with an Arukamite of this size, an error appears on the status window, causing all skills that use dimensional energy to halt for approximately 24 hours. 
Gilbert Reynolds, the director of England's security service, was informed by David that all the information has been recorded. Reynolds then contacted the doctor to inquire about the success of the test, which the doctor confirmed. Reynolds believed that if the technology worked on Suho, it would also be effective on the aliens from planet Aruka. The doctor agreed but reminded Reynolds to exercise caution as the Aruka elves are close allies and have contributed greatly to their technological advancements. Reynolds argued that alliances do not last forever and that Aruka may eventually turn against them. The doctor responded by saying there are still many challenges to overcome before the technology can be commercialized. The director stressed the urgency of the situation, as the incidence of crime committed by the awakened individuals is increasing globally. Despite the necessity of maintaining a symbiotic relationship with the Aruka elves, the director maintained that it could end at any moment. The doctor attempted to reason with the director, but the director persisted, stating that the balance of power will soon shift and it's crucial to find a solution to regulate it. After the conversation, the doctor recognized that Suho posed a challenge, as the individual had physical attributes with an average of 8,000, making it unclear if they could defeat such powerful monsters. Meanwhile, Suho was rushing back with a resolve to destroy Hiro. At a meeting of the Suho Guild, Junho informed the members that they were in trouble and presented them with Suho's message. The members were horrified. Reports were calling the Guild a disgrace due to the confrontation with Hiro. The comments on the reports made the members angry. Jeshik asked about the government's response, and Ing Su replied that they only expressed pity. This made Jeshik furious, as the government allowed a foreign invader to enter the country and attack them, and they didn't even apprehend Hiro. Ding Su then saw a report that Hiro had already returned to Japan. Junho tried to calm the group and said that it would be problematic if this became an international issue, so they needed to handle it themselves. Another article from America suggested that the Suho Guild should move to the US for protection. The members believed that only Suho could resolve the situation and then remembered what Hiro had told them. Hiro had threatened to kill them within 10 days if Suho was not brought to him. Jeshik felt humiliated as he couldn't even move. They knew that all they could do was wait for Suho's return. Junho said that they needed to take action before Suho came back. Junho and Ding Su were outside searching for something when Junho received a call from Kim Maizo, who thanked them for their cooperation and asked them not to hold a grudge against the government. Junho hung up and informed Ding Su that they were going to the beast farm, as he suspected the bureau had placed listening devices in key locations before they left. Ding Su defended Maizo, saying she always helped them, but Junho agreed and added that enemies often hide close to home. Junho and Ding Su arrived at the beast farm and discussed the growth of the family and the whereabouts of the owner. They saw some monkeys in the trees and recognized them as Japanese monkeys. However, a flash report caught their attention and informed them of Park Suho attacking Tokyo. As Park Suho landed, the people nearby panicked. He yelled for Hiro to come out. The criminal task force of the Awakener Federation had arrived at the scene, along with tank battalions and unmanned air drone battalions. Junho and Ding Su were concerned as they saw reports about the situation. At the Japanese Ministry of Defense, a combat satellite was targeted on Suho. Daigo reminded the minister that they were attempting to get Suho on their side, but the minister responded that Saseki had arrived and they needed to assess whether to use their defenses. Park Suho continued calling out for Hiro when Saseki approached him. Saseki informed Suho that he was under arrest for illegal entry, causing social chaos, spreading fear, and other violations of public order. Suho asked if he was Hiro, and Saseki introduced himself and told Suho to get down from the wyvern and surrender peacefully. Suho replied that if Saseki was not Hiro, then he should leave. Saseki, seeing that Suho wouldn't comply, used his skill binding to try to capture him but Suho sent Saseki flying with a punch. Saseki recovered, bewildered by what had happened. Suho praised Saseki, saying that if their territory is under attack, they should protect it with their life. Park Suho then broke free from the binding, impressing Saseki who commented that if he hadn't cast a debuff in time, his face would have been crushed. Suho told Saseki to leave, but Saseki continued to attack. Suho used air vortex, sending Saseki crashing into a building, stunning the crowd and those at the Ministry of Defense. Suho continued calling out for Hiro. The Minister of Defense was impressed by Suho and deemed him more valuable than Hiro. Suho threatened to burn everything if Hiro wasn't brought out. People ran away after hearing his threat. A police officer approached Suho and asked him to stop, but Suho demanded that Hiro be brought to him and gave them 30 minutes to comply.
The officer explained that Hero couldn't come at the moment because he was raiding a level 7 dungeon and it would take at least 10 days for him to come out. Suho expressed disbelief that someone who takes 10 days to clear a dungeon would dare to provoke him and said he would return after 10 days before leaving. Those at the Ministry of Defense expressed concern that allowing Suho to leave would lead to international embarrassment, but the minister argued that using the full power of the Defense Army against One Awakener would be more humiliating. Meanwhile, Suho's group cheered as they saw the news of Suho declaring war against Hiro and sending Saseki flying. Another report stated that the Japanese government viewed the incident as a threat to Japan and demanded that Suho be extradited into their custody, threatening to declare war against Korea if this demand was not met. Suho's group was having a discussion when they noticed Suho's arrival. They heard Gunwoo tell Suho that they had been idle. As Suho entered the room, the group members cowered, sensing his anger. Meanwhile, the government officials debated on whether to surrender Suho to the Japanese government. The president arrived and inquired if Suho and Sungwoo knew each other, to which the assistant replied that there was no connection between the two. The officials were perplexed as to why Sungwoo would attack Suho. The director presented two theories. Either Hiro had grown envious of Suho's rapid rise to fame, or the Japanese government had planned to scout Suho. The director emphasized Suho's significance, explaining that not only Japan but countries all over the world were eager to recruit him due to his unique skill of mastering the elemental magic typically only performed by the high elves of planet Aruka. The officials were told about the recent rise in the number of people who had returned from the planet Aruka after studying it with great difficulty. However, there was no awakener who could perform area magic. One of the officials asked if it was the instant harvest ability and the director confirmed it. The director explained that Suho was like a winning lottery ticket that could bring in a lot of money. The officials changed their stance and decided to protect Suho, even if it resulted in war. While Suho's group stumbled out of a portal, exhausted, Suho told them to get up as they still had 10 rounds left. He then received a call from Kim Maizo, who informed him of Japan's reaction and proposed a solution. Suho then met with the manager of SPFC, Max, who told him about Hiro's provocation. Suho was confused as to why he would do such a thing, and Max explained that it was all for the sake of earning money. If the match between Suho and Hiro took place, an astronomical amount of money could be earned. Max advised Suho to accept the match, saying that if he agreed, he could prevent a war from happening and earn a huge sum of money. Suho asked if he could legally kill Hiro if he agreed, to which Max confirmed that the SPFC rules wouldn't hold him accountable for any accidental deaths. Kim Maizo then informed Max they would discuss the matter further with Suho and get back to him. Max left, and Maizo assured Suho that he didn't have to agree to the match if he didn't want to, and that there wouldn't be a war. Suho expressed his desire to fight Hiro, and Maizo suggested donating the proceeds of the match to Japan to alleviate tensions. Suho agreed. Maizo then gave Suho an official government order, inviting him to attend the annual General Assembly of all guilds, a gathering of all major level 6 guilds. Suho mentioned that their guild wasn't yet level 6, but Maizo informed him that it had officially reached that level and presented him with a certificate. The government was also handing over the Ajuyongbu region to Suho and granting him autonomous rights over the territory, officially recognizing the land managed by the Suho guild as the 13th area of Seoul. Suho informed the others about the recent developments. They expressed their dissatisfaction with the government who had ignored their struggles before. Suho explained that the decision had already been made and the government would establish a city first. He informed them that they would be moving their headquarters from Namyangyu and dividing the new territories into smaller districts. Myungjin then came across some news, stating that with the agriculturalization of Suho's land, Korea was poised to become a major grain producer, bringing in a significant amount of income. The news of Hiro's team completing a level 7 dungeon in just eight days spread, along with Hiro's response to Suho's taunting saying that he would teach Suho some manners. The announcement of the Suho and Hiro match in the SPFC also garnered attention, with many people betting on Hiro to win. Another report showed that Suho was set to receive a massive payout of 240 billion, the highest fighter money dividend in history. Suho's group was shocked to see the amount of money, but then learned that Suho planned to donate all the fight money to Japan. They understood the reason for the donation, and Suho arrived to tell them to keep training. Suho then headed to Ujiangbu to check it out. Meanwhile, Akiko hacked into the Awakener Bureau's system to gather information about Suho. 
she was shocked to discover that Suho spent a thousand years on another planet. As the fight between Suho and Hiro approached, the odds heavily favored Hiro's victory. The tickets for their match in the Tokyo Stadium had already been sold out five days prior. Two days before the match, Park Suho remained secluded within his own territory, Suho Land. Akiko informed Hiro that according to the records, Suho had spent a thousand years on another planet before returning to Earth. Hiro asked if Suho had also regressed several times for a thousand years like he had, but Akiko was certain that Suho hadn't used a regression stone. Hiro was skeptical, but Akiko explained that Suho had only spent 10 years on the other planet, where time flows two times faster than on Earth. Hence, spending a thousand years on a planet that is not tied to Earth's time wasn't impossible. And this also explains why Hiro and Suho have never met, as Hiro has regressed 20 years 25 times. Hiro wonders how Suho didn't age during this time, and Akiko researches and finds the existence of the rare item called the Crimson Divine Peach. This fruit only appears once every thousand years on one of the planets and disappears after 10 days, but grants eternal youth and immortality to whoever eats it. Akiko expresses concern as Suho has lived longer than him, but Hiro responds that he won't let anyone interfere with his plans. On the day of the match, the news was still searching for Suho's whereabouts. Meanwhile, Suho was occupied with farming on his territory, while Ding Su informed him there were only three hours left and told Suho that he had to leave. Suho summoned his wyvern and instructed Ding Su to raid some dungeons before he departed. In the stadium, the crowd assumed that Suho had given up on the match. Hiro inquired about any news regarding Suho, and Akiko informed him that Suho had recently expanded his land to Ujiangbu. Hiro was confident that Suho knew what was to come in the future, as the first level 7 dungeon to open in Korea was in Ujiangbu. He remembered the combat unit that attempted to challenge the level 7 dungeon, as soon as it appeared was destroyed, and Korea, which lost half of its total S rank awakeners, was unable to prevent the dungeon break in the end. The use of large explosives to eliminate the level 7 monsters resulted in Ujiangbu being reduced to ashes. Soon after, there were numerous dungeon breaches on the continent, and the monsters that traveled south through North Korea caused South Korea to completely collapse. Hiro believed that the government was trying to prevent all of this from happening by propelling Suho forward. Suho made his entrance and landed on the stage to the cheers of the Korean crowd. He called back his wyvern and challenged Hiro. The crowd yelled Hiro's name as he stood up, but Akiko remained worried, even though Hiro reassured her that he would return safely. Hiro approached Suho and asked if he was a survivor of the apocalypse and if there was another regression stone and how many years he could regress with it, but Suho was unaware of what he was referring to. Thinking that Suho was feigning ignorance, Hiro attacked. Suho countered with a punch that sent Hiro flying and bouncing on the floor before hitting the barrier. The onlookers were taken aback. Suho approached Hiro and mocked him for his weakness, telling him to get up. Hiro rose to his feet, confused by what was happening. Suho told Hiro he was like a frog in a well, causing Hiro to become enraged and attack, but he was repeatedly hit by Suho. Suho then used a tornado to deliver a powerful kick, causing Hiro to crash onto the ground. Suho followed up with a fire skill, destroying the area and leaving the spectators stunned as they watched Hiro getting overpowered. Finally, they saw Suho holding Hiro by the neck. Suho realized that Hiro was only pretending to be dead and asked why he came searching for him. Hiro answered that he wanted to kill Suho and that he deserved to die as his HP recovered. Suho was puzzled. Hiro explained that his plans, which he had made through 500 years of hard work and sacrifice, had been ruined because of Suho as his appearance started to change. Suho was perplexed by what Hiro was saying. Hiro then transformed into a monster and shouted that he needed to save the earth. He used the Fury of God, a devastating skill that destroyed the area and sent Suho flying back. The stadium was ruined, injuring and killing those in the vicinity. Hiro was pleased with the Fury of God, a skill so deadly and powerful that the human body cannot handle it, and so he had to call upon the physique of a monster. He couldn't believe that he had used the skill, which he had been saving for the level 8 boss, the Toad Monarch, on a mere human like Suho. Hiro was taken aback when he spotted Suho emerging unscathed from the rubble, and he inquired about the source of Suho's immense strength. Suho told him that it wasn't due to any item, but rather a skill named Forest's Blessing that fully restored lost stamina and mana in just five seconds. Hiro was infuriated by Suho's smile and launched a sudden attack, shouting that the planet would be destroyed because of him. 
Suho saw Hiro's information and realized that he was a U-rank monster hybrid, Suho effortlessly blocked Hiro's attacks and retaliated with a swift kick. Suho followed up with another kick, sending Hiro flying backward. Hiro was stunned that there was a human he couldn't defeat, even after transforming into a monster, and came to the conclusion that there was no hope for this regression. He decided to start over. However, Suho continued his barrage of attacks, stating that he would teach him the harsh realities. Hiro was using the Stone of Replica while enduring Suho's strikes and realized that it was nearly complete. He thought that in the next regression, he would have Suho's power and even his soul. But as Hiro tried to attack, he was hit by Suho's fusion, sending him flying and crashing through walls, landing near a group of people who cursed him. The Stone of Replica was shattered, and Hiro saw Suho land beside him. Suho informed him that the reason he wasn't able to save Earth for such a long time was due to his own weakness. Hiro attempted to speak, but Suho cut him off, warning him never to enter his territory again or face death. Hiro retorted that 95% of humanity would perish in the apocalypse and that Suho would soon meet his own demise. Suho replied that Hiro's past wouldn't dictate his future and there is no future for a guy who lives in the past like him. Then delivered a final blow to end the battle. Suyoung was observing the fight and recalled asking Suho why they couldn't be together. Suho responded that she was still too weak and that their strength must be balanced or one side would crumble. She cursed and walked away. The news reported Suho's overwhelming victory and the multiple casualties at the stadium. Another report stated that Hiro was unconscious for a week. Suddenly waking up, Hiro remembered Suho's threat and saw the news and people's negative comments about him. Akiko entered and took his phone, saying that people were simply shocked by his defeat. Hiro told her that he wanted to be alone for a while and stood up, seeing the people outside jeering at him. He then looked at the stone of replica and noticed it was interrupted and thought that if he had held on a bit longer, he could have copied Suho's skills. He summoned the regression stone, an item that would allow him to return to Earth 20 years ago. He realized that his only option was to go back and eliminate Suho, which he could do in two years. Suddenly, three people entered Hiro's room and told him they were ordered to bring him in. Hiro smirked and one of the men warned him to come peacefully, stating that there were two more people outside. Hiro mocked them, saying that five of them wouldn't be enough to defeat him. He surmised that the defense agency had recorded his conversation with Suho and was after the items in his inventory. Hiro asked the men if they were planning to torture him, and one of them cursed at him. Hiro then declared that Japan would soon regret their mistake. The room exploded as the people outside were knocked down. The two men outside saw two of their members being held by Hiro. Hiro warned them not to move and threatened to kill the man he was holding then demanded to know who had given the order. The man replied that it was the commissioner. Hiro understood that the commissioner was simply waiting for him to falter and then moved in to strike. The leader tried to defend the commissioner, but Hiro pointed out that they were only after the items in his inventory. He declared that there was no stopping the country's greed and asked if Akiko was aware of what was happening. The man confirmed and Hiro became incensed, killing the man he was holding and attacking the remaining members. News of the growth of the Suho Guild and Ujiangbu becoming the 13th section of Seoul was reported. Ding Su then saw news of Hiro killing two S rankers and fleeing Japan. At a conference, Mr. Takeo suspected Hiro to be a spy sent by Korea and demanded an explanation from the Korean government regarding the recent terrorist attack related to Lee sun -woo. The Blue House denied the accusation. Ding Su, worried that Lee sun -woo might come after them, looked for Suho. As he was running, he saw people running away and thought Sungwoo was already in the area. He ran with the group, but Jeshik told him that a portal was opening and they were heading there. They found that the portal was a level 7 dungeon with only 42 days left until it burst. The group was worried as they thought 42 days was too short. Junho realized that they were too focused on becoming the 13th section and had taken in people without considering their capabilities. If a break occurred, they couldn't guarantee everyone's survival. He was at a loss on what to do and thought of looking for Suho, but they noticed an animal and realized it was Suho. Suho explains to the group that they move to a bigger hunting ground where a large prey has presented itself. Ding Su is concerned that they are still low level, but Suho tells them that the prey is offering itself, but if they keep running away, they will always be looking back towards their past. Suho, along with Myungjin and Jeshik, decide to enter the dungeon, but later choose to bring Ding Su instead inside, they are surprised by an undead. 
news of a level 7 dungeon appearing in Korea creates panic and the airports are filled with people trying to escape. It is the 8th level 7 dungeon in the world. The officials discuss the situation and estimate that they need to clear the dungeon twice a day to prevent it from bursting. They are uncertain if Suho's party can handle it, and they find that even the guilds are struggling with the increasing number of level 6 dungeons. The officials discussed the situation and considered evacuating the people to Seoul, but they realized that a level 7 dungeon appearing in Seoul would cause everyone to die. The director remembered the wall of trees in Suho land and believed it would be the safest place if the level 7 dungeon there was taken care of. They contacted Kim Maizo for updates on the situation and were informed that everything was fine in Suho land. The Ministry of Defense also dispatched Sun Jinwoo's 707A Special Forces Unit to Jiangbu. The director decided to act as the on-site commander for the level 7 dungeon and planned to go to the location. Meanwhile, Akiko was imprisoned and Mr. Takeo visited her. She informed him that he was mistaken and Mr. Takeo displayed a bracelet claiming that they already had information about it. He believed that even Hiro was unaware of this. The diary held details about the future and they discovered that Hiro had gathered individuals with great potential, making it seem like he trained them for his own gain. He rose to fame as the country's hero and champion, all made possible by the regression stone. Akiko smirked, realizing that Mr. Takeo wanted the stone. He asked her where Hiro was hiding and promised to fulfill her wish if she told him. Akiko replied that she didn't know, as one of the Awakeners confirmed her truthfulness. She stated that they shouldn't have made Hiro their enemy. Takeo was informed of Hiro's last known location and ordered the use of drones to track him down. He was confident that Hiro had the regression stone in his possession and aimed to acquire it for himself. Meanwhile, Hiro saw a news report of Suho entering the level 7 dungeon with only three people and took out a notebook to record information about them. He noticed another piece of news about the best combat team in Korea heading to the level 7 dungeon and remembered Sun Jin Woo. He recalled that Korea's destruction began after the combat team led by Korea's number one was defeated. Unit 707A arrived on Suho's territory with the director and Junho informed them that Suho did not like outsiders entering their land. The director argued that it was a national crisis and not just the Suho Guild's responsibility to clear it. Myungjin discovered he had a new skill called King of Nirvana but needed 1000 achievement points to unlock it. He calculated he would need to kill 12 level 1 dungeon bosses to achieve this. Meanwhile, Sun Jin Woo told the director they planned to start the raid immediately, but the director advised them to wait at least a day. He explained that even Lee Sun Woo's team had casualties and they lacked manpower compared to Japan, so losing even one person would be a huge loss. Furthermore, Suho had not yet emerged. Jin Woo agreed to wait for a day. Maizo visited Su Young and asked why she hadn't greeted her when she arrived. She teased her, asking if it was because Suho was not around. Sei arrived with food and informed them about Sanji being rejected by Suho. Miss Mo thought they were dating, but Sei explained that Suho rejected Sanji because she was weak. Sei then asked Miss Mo to introduce her to Suho, as she was among the strongest women in the country. Suyoung was angry after hearing Sei. Sun Jin Woo's team, including Suyoung, was preparing to enter a dungeon. Before entering, Jin Woo informed the team of their plan and reminded them of their status as the top team in the country then entered the dungeon. However, two members failed to enter before the portal closed, leaving only 28 members inside. To everyone's surprise, Suho's group emerged from the dungeon, with Ding Su and Jeshik collapsing upon exit. The news quickly spread that Suho had successfully cleared a level 7 dungeon in just 24 hours. The director expressed gratitude to Suho and requested that he share his strategy for the dungeon. Maizo added that even maps or details about the monsters would be beneficial to teams preparing for future raids. Suho asked if they had assembled a combat team on his hunting grounds. The director explained that they were in a state of national emergency and it was wise to have more teams participate. Suho confidently replied that he was enough. Maizo was surprised by Suho's words and thought that a level 7 dungeon wasn't a threat to Suho and sees it as an island full of treasures, and them sending a team was seen as an attempt to take a share of the wealth. Suho then noticed a large crowd gathered around them. Maizo agreed and stated that no more teams would be sent, but one of the special units was already in the middle of the raid. Upon hearing this, Suho became furious and asked who had given permission. Maizo pointed to Junho. Suho then grabbed Junho and went looking for Myungjin, ordering them to bring him immediately. 
Suho entered the portal while dragging Junho and had Myungjin thrown inside. The doctors monitoring Jeshik and Ing Su were shocked by their dimensional energy levels. When they woke up and realized they were already outside the dungeon, they asked about Suho's whereabouts. They were told that Suho had entered the dungeon with the other members 20 minutes prior. Jeshik estimated that they had 30 minutes, while Ding Su suggested they use all their money to buy items. Meanwhile, Hiro saw the news of Suho completing the dungeon in 24 hours and was shocked. Suho then accomplished a feat again, reducing the time to 21 hours. Junho and Myungjin were also exhausted and received treatment from the healing team. Maizo offered to take care of them, but Suho declared it was a waste of time and said they would recover with sleep once they re-entered the dungeon. Ding Su and Jeshik arrived and greeted Suho, Suho instructed them to carry Junho and Myungjin and follow him. Jeshik was concerned that all the guild members would enter, but Maizo offered to monitor the construction process. The group then re-entered the dungeon. Inside, Suho ordered everyone to wake up. Junho protested and told Suho to let them rest, but Suho explained that they had already slept for 30 minutes and that, with their current levels, 30 minutes of sleep should be sufficient for recovery. The group was surprised to see that their levels had increased. Suho continued, explaining that their bodies were growing stronger at a rapid pace, but their minds hadn't yet caught up, which was why they still felt tired despite having slept enough. Suho scolded the team, saying they needed to get stronger quickly so he could leave the house in their hands while he was away. He then warned them of an incoming enemy. The group easily defeated the skeletons that attacked them. They then encountered a group of undead orcs, and Myungjin used Dragon Ascension to take out some of the orcs. Ding Su summoned a giant crossbow and fired at the monsters, and Jeshik cursed while killing the undead. Junho tried to use his new skill but to no avail. As everyone felt their power waning, Ding Su lost accuracy, and Myungjin realized it was a debuff. They then spotted a banshee behind a horde of undead orcs. Suho summoned his fairies and believed they were faster. Maizo was called to watch a video that Ding Su took inside the dungeon, showing a powerful S-rank undead type monster called a Banshee. The Banshee has debuff abilities and can attack from range. The director asked if anyone other than Sungwu had cleared a level 7 dungeon, and Maizo said apart from Suho, no one had returned. They saw Jeshik receive healing and a buff from Suho's fairies, and without this healing, no team could defeat the Banshee without casualties. The director asked how long the SF unit had been in the dungeon and was told nine Earth days had passed, but the unit is weaker than Sungwu's team and could collapse quickly. The director ordered that they must be saved. The director was then informed that Suho's team had successfully cleared the level 7 dungeon in a surprising 13 hours. The director remembered a way to save the SF unit and ordered the team to hold Suho, but he had already entered the dungeon. Maizo estimated that Suho's fourth raid would take around six hours, and there was news of Suho reducing the clear time to five hours, while others criticized the director's poor command. Suho emerged from the dungeon and was approached by the director and Maizo, who asked for his help in saving the SF unit. Suho questioned why he should help the thieves, to which Maizo explained that the team led by Jin had already been in the dungeon for nine days, three days outside, and spending more than 15 days in the dungeon drops the survival rate below 50%. The director admitted fault, but Suho asked how he could save those already inside. Maizo explained that as long as there are soldiers that are still alive in the last dungeon before the dungeon break and under the condition that they don't go over the capacity limit. Additional people can enter the same dungeon. Suho realized that he needed to complete the remaining dungeons as fast as possible and rescue the soldiers in the last dungeon. The director appealed to Suho, as he was the only one who could help. Suho asked if there were still open spots, to which Maizo responded that there were two available. Suho figured that if he could clear it four to five times a day, he could reach the soldiers before it was too late. The director stressed the urgency, explaining that the longer they waited, the lower the survival rate. He offered to compensate Suho for his time and earnings, but Suho declined, telling others to focus on their own training. Suho then headed to the dungeons. News of Suho rescuing 707A unit was reported. Suho entered the dungeon 10 minutes ago and was expected to take two hours to clear it. However, people were shocked when Suho emerged after just 13 minutes on his sixth try. He then immediately re-entered the dungeon. The following report was Suho continuously completes 15 dungeon raids with an average clear time of 20 minutes.
The reports then said the survival rate of the unit has fallen below 50 percent and has led many people to gather in the square and light candles to pray for their safe return. Meanwhile, the 707A unit was heading to their base camp, Suyong signaled to stop as some of the members was anxious, they saw a wraith from the distance. The team attempted to conceal themselves, but one member unintentionally made a noise and attracted the attention of a wraith. The wraith alerted the nearby monsters, and the snipers managed to eliminate it, but they were too late as they were already surrounded by a large group of monsters. Sei commanded them to prepare for battle, but while they were fighting, they received word from the base camp that an unknown monster was approaching. Sei attacked upon seeing it, but Suyong tried to intervene and was hit by one of the undead. The team noticed a decrease in their combat power and was ordered to retreat. Suho, who had already cleared the dungeon 87 times in six days, re-entered the final dungeon to try and save the combat unit. The Banshee reduced Sei's stats as they fought, while the rest of the team struggled against the monsters. Meanwhile, Jin Wu's group reached the boss room, but received news that their base was under attack and the main squad was engaged in battle. One member suggested going back to save them, but they were suddenly trapped by a barrier, separating Jin Wu from the rest of the team, and Death Knights appeared from the ground. The Banshee was defeated, and Sei fell to the ground, unable to move and thinking it was the end. Suyong was also on the ground, thinking of Suho. Suddenly, she saw a fairy by her side, and the other members saw fairies as well. Sei noticed her HP recovering, and Suyong recognized the skill. Suho then arrived and defeated the monsters on his way. The combat team regained their strength and counterattacked. Sei quickly killed the undead around her, and they saw Suho take out most of the monsters. Suyong ran to Suho and hugged him while crying. Sei was surprised to see Suho and Suyong together. The combat team realized that this must be the final dungeon and that Suho had cleared everything by himself. However, they were confused when they saw Suho pushing Suyong away. Suho told Suyong that she couldn't be his mate because she was too weak, but she insisted on hugging him for a moment. Suho pushed her away a little too hard, causing Suyong to fall onto a rock. She cursed at Suho, who approached her and asked if she was okay. He explained that she would be in danger if she stayed near him. Suho received a message from his fairies, but a monster emerged from the ground. Sei suggested they head to the base camp and search for the scouting party, but Suho informed them that they wouldn't find anything even if they went, and that there were five survivors in the boss room. Sei realized it must be the scouting party. Suho told them to follow him, and warned that the group might die if they were late. Suho then sprinted off, leaving the combat team behind, as a horde of ghouls appeared in front of them. Suho summoned his beasts, and the combat team was amazed, and Sei was captivated. Suyong warned the others that a flying entity was approaching them. Suho greeted the lick, surprising the combat team as it was the strongest king of the undead. At the same time, the scouting group was confronted by the Death Knights. Jin Wu realized that the enemy was a lick, and that destroying its vessel would cause it and its army to die. One of the members cautioned Jin Wu, but he replied that he was the only one who could do it and hoped for their survival before entering the building. Suho quickly eliminated the horde of undead with his fire skill and summoned a wyvern, using his mirror skill to create four wyvern heads that destroyed the lick. He then instructed the combat team to follow him. Inside the building, Jin Wu was blocked by a wall of monsters and struggled as he was overwhelmed by the beasts. Meanwhile, the scouting team outside was struggling with one of them injured by a death knight. Suho arrived, charging in boar form and changing to a bear to attack the knights. He then shifted back to human form and finished off the enemies with his fire skills. Suho asked about one missing member and was told that the captain had gone inside the temple. He told the team to wait for the main squad and stay there, then went inside to save the captain. Suho shattered the barrier and stormed into the temple. He burned the monsters and transformed into a wolf, tearing down the wall. He discovered Jin Wu still alive but being drained of his life force by a vessel. Suho realized that if he had arrived a moment later, the lick would have been resurrected. He destroyed the vessel, causing the temple to explode and the undead to disappear. Suho emerged from the dungeon carrying Jin Wu, reassuring the team that he was still alive. The crowd cheered as Suho and the combat team exited the dungeon. Despite being approached by many people, Suho simply took flight, with Sei gazing at him wistfully. Sei asked Suyong if she had feelings for Suho, to which Suyong denied. Sei then inquired if it was okay for her to ask Suho out, as she believed she had found her soulmate. Hiro saw the news and was shocked. 
He realized his phone balance was low and feared his accounts were locked. He considered selling the blood crystals in his inventory but knew he would be caught. Some thugs bumped into him and he overheard them making fun of Lee Sunwoo. He decided to use them as offerings to enhance the regression stone. Junwoo woke up and was told that Park Suho had saved him and the other soldiers. Meanwhile, Sei attempted to visit Suho and brought food dressed as a bunny maid. Ding Su and Junho informed Sei that Suho was still asleep. She gave them the food and asked to let her know when Suho wakes up. Ding Su and Junho were puzzled. Inside the room, Suho was sleeping in boar form. Junho considered waking him up, but Ding Su warned him that the last time he tried, he nearly got bitten to death. Sei returned and entered the room, only to find Suho had transformed into a cat. Meanwhile, Jinwoo and Su Young ran into each other and were both headed to see Suho. Sei was snuggling with Suho and said that their mission would end the next day and they would have to return to the guild. She wanted to spend time with him. Ding Su reminded Suho that the time for the transformation was almost over. Su Young then appeared and asked for Suho. Suho returned to his human form and was found by Su Young lying on Sei's chest. Enraged, Su Young threw a box at Suho and cursed before storming away. Suho woke up and was thanked by Jin Wu, but went back to sleep. Meanwhile, a woman was shown being pursued. She entered a room and found someone inside. The man identified himself as being from the criminal task force of Korea's Awakener Bureau and asked about a woman who died from a gunshot wound to the head at a murder scene in Silam Dong, but was now alive. The woman's eyes changed as the man brandished his gun. The person outside broke down the door and entered, but saw that the man was being held by a monster. Maizo informed the director that the executives were waiting in the conference room at the bureau. The general manager urgently summoned the director to the bureau, stating that the situation was critical. News reports showed dungeons breaking around the world as people tried to escape. The director was informed that the ongoing monster wave that started in Harbin was now beyond what conventional weapons could handle. If the path of the monsters was redirected by nuclear weapons, they would head toward North Korea instead of Russia. The rising number of dungeons in Seoul and the ineffectiveness of level 6 guilds were also exposed, with experts warning that the city was no longer safe. They were informed of a serial murder case transferred to them by the police department. Two members of the special task force investigating the suspect were killed, and the suspect fled. The director inquired if the killer was an awakener and was told it was a vampire who had died and been resurrected three times. The director was getting a headache and decided to disband the SF combined unit and return after the task was finished tomorrow. Maizo instructed Su Young to return to the detection team. Su Young requested to be sent to the most pressing location with the aim of improving her skills. The director was informed that requests for assistance had already been received from two guilds. The break time was too short and the shortage of combat teams was a problem. One person said that only Park Suho could solve the issue. Another person pointed out that the number of negative comments about Suho was rising and suggested they take action, and was told that people were saying that if he wanted to, he could handle all the dungeons in Seoul, but he wasn't doing anything, and the Guild Association had noted that the Suho Guild was not doing much in comparison to the benefits it was receiving. The director was frustrated. Suho inquired with Ding Su about what the rest of the team was up to. Ding Su informed him that Jeshik was training new recruits, Junho was supervising construction, and Myungjin was often going out and talking about rescuing vagabonds. Suho then considered constructing a moat. Ding Su then noticed a news report about a candlelight rally being held, as people were dissatisfied with Suho for not taking action, while Seoul was in chaos due to the dungeons. Suho responded to Ding Su's question, asking why he would hunt in other people's territory. Maizo arrived and informed them that the Awakener Bureau had made a request for assistance, but Suho declined. Maizo attempted to explain, but then an explosion occurred at the Blood Crystal power plant. Suho arrived and used a water vortex to extinguish the fire, but people fell from the building. Suho summoned his wyvern to save them. Suho quickly summoned his wyvern and managed to rescue the workers who were falling, successfully saving them. Maizo and Dongsu arrived at the scene and inquired about the situation. Junho speculated that there might have been an issue with one of the blood crystal generators, but further investigation was needed to confirm. Maizo suggested gathering all the team leaders to discuss the explosion and its implications. Suho expressed his desire to build a large moat around Suho land for increased defense when he's away. Dongsu understood that Suho wanted to strengthen the land's security. 
However, Junho pointed out the financial implications, mentioning that they were currently in debt. Suho was surprised to learn about their financial situation, realizing that such a construction project would require a significant amount of money. Dongsu added that their previous donations and sacrifices had depleted their funds. Suho expressed his determination to earn money to fund the construction project. Junho and Dongsu were skeptical, stating that the profits from dungeons wouldn't be sufficient. Maizo then mentioned a treasure dungeon in Gwangyu Field, Jiangi Province, which had valuable items and a high yield of blood crystals. Dongsu was surprised to hear about the rare treasure dungeon, but doubted that it would be accessible to players from other guilds. However, Suho found the idea appealing. Suho proposed the idea of using their free entrance privilege to enter the Scorpion Dungeon. Jeshik expressed skepticism, stating that even if there were positions available, they would claim otherwise. However, Maizo revealed that a cooperation request had been received from the Goryeo Guild, who managed the dungeon. It turned out that the Goryeo Guild was in need of combat teams. Furthermore, their parent company, Goryeo Construction, offered to complete the construction project at a discounted price. Excited about the opportunity, Jeshik eagerly agreed to participate and test his new strength. Myungjin suggested forming parties with the new recruits in the guild as a way to test their strength. Junho agreed, seeing it as a beneficial opportunity. Maizo took on the responsibility of managing the contract with Goryeo Construction while they were away. Suho agreed with the plan and expressed readiness to proceed. News of the explosion and Suho's heroic act of saving the personnel spread, along with reports of Russia employing a bomb to halt the monster wave. The media also covered Suho's group embarking on a raid of the Scorpion Dungeon. Inside the dungeon, the group fought tirelessly against a horde of monsters. Myungjin, however, realized that his Dragon Ascension skill was lacking power. In response, he summoned his Vagabonds for assistance. Suho was delighted to collect five blood crystals from just two monsters, confirming the dungeon's treasure status. Meanwhile, the soldiers guarding the borders saw a heart of monsters coming to them, the commander was informed of the alarming news of the annihilation of the First Corps and Dingduchian. Faced with the overwhelming challenge, some suggested a strategic retreat from the northern part of Jiangi and focusing on defending Seoul's defense wall. In the Scorpion Dungeon's Situation Room, representatives from the Awakener Bureau inquired about Suho's expected exit time. The operator informed them that there were still four days until the dungeon's break, and it was rumored that Suho would be taking his time farming the last door. Upon hearing this, the director was furious and exclaimed that Suho was wasting time playing around in a level 4 dungeon for four days. The director ordered the operators to convey a threatening message to Suho, warning him that Ujiangbu's Suho land was on the verge of destruction and that his entire family would meet their demise. Officials were shocked to learn that three meteors had crashed in the Dingduchian field, resulting in the complete destruction of one core. They were even more surprised to discover that the meteors had been summoned by a powerful monster using magic. The presence of dimensional energy during the impact raised questions about the possibility of such magic. Further investigation revealed references to meteor summoning in Aruka's magic encyclopedia. Upon careful analysis of the footage, officials observed a humanoid figure among the monsters. Initially, they suspected the individual to be a North Korean returnee with taming skills. However, upon closer examination, they identified the figure as a vampire, connecting the findings to a recently broken Level 7 vampire dungeon in Giseong and the reported vampire serial murder case in Seoul, they concluded that some vampires may have infiltrated the city. Officials discussed the means of combating vampires and their vulnerabilities. Official 1 wondered if driving a nail into their chest would be effective, while Official 2 mentioned that high-level mana attacks from capable individuals, known as returnees, could be somewhat effective. However, they noted that only SSS rank returnees would be able to fully defeat vampires. Someone also shared confidential information from the NIS, revealing that the British government was employing low-rank returnees armed with Arukamite bullets, a synthetic mineral developed by Dr. Toddler, to combat vampires. They anticipated providing further updates as more information became available. Officials informed the president that if someone is bitten by a vampire, they either become enslaved or die. Ordinary people are affected in this way, while the impact on returnees is still not fully understood. Two special task force agents from RCD have died after being attacked by vampires. The president expressed concern that these seemingly invulnerable creatures have made their way from Giseong to Seoul. The president doubted if locking down all gates within Seoul would be sufficient. 
In breaking news, it was reported that the monsters have annihilated the entire one core subordinate unit after the meteor crash in Paju Field. The third core subordinate unit has decided to withdraw to the soul barriers and reorganize. Additionally, the Chinese government is launching a tactical nuke attack in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, and the Russians have started their attack on Yulanbadar, Mongolia. In response to the escalating situation, martial law has been declared in Seoul. Maizo received a call from the director, urging her to leave Suho land immediately due to the national emergency. The third core subordinate unit was withdrawing to the Seoul barriers, and Ujiangbu was at risk of being bombed once the monsters clustered there. The director emphasized the urgency of the situation and advised Maizo to leave before it was too late, even stating that not even Suho could stop it. The workers were instructed to gather, and Maizo quickly found Granny to inform her that they needed to leave. In another location, Su Young and her team gathered at the dungeon entrance. As the team members called out to her, Su Young signaled them to be quiet. A woman emerged from the entrance, causing Su Young to be on guard. Suddenly, the woman attacked one of the guards, revealing herself to be a vampire. The other guards opened fire, but the vampire swiftly vanished, leaving behind only a dried up corpse. Su Young, armed with her powerful Soul Slayer sword, swiftly killed a vampire attacking the guards. The guards burned the vampire's corpse, and spectators recognized Su Young's skill and weapon. Su Young instructed her members to prepare equipment near the gate. When she checked with the gate operators, she discovered that Sukja Lee and Maizo Kim from Suho Land were not on the list of people who had passed through the gate. Su Young anxiously tried to reach Sukja Lee and Maizo Kim through a phone call, frustrated by their delay. Meanwhile, Maizo was trying to convince Granny Sukja to leave with them for safety. Granny Sukja hesitated, as Jio Nu's father and uncle were not present. As they were discussing, a soldier entered and informed them that all the workers were evacuating, but Jio Nu was missing. Granny assumed he might be in the beast resting zone. Suddenly, they noticed a dark shadow approaching on the horizon, which turned out to be a swarm of bats. Confused by the appearance of a swarm of bats in broad daylight, a car crashed into the room, revealing three vampires. Maizo swiftly attacked and managed to take down the vampires, allowing the others to escape. However, the vampires quickly regained their strength, and one of them dealt a powerful blow to Maizo, rendering her unconscious. As the vampires prepared to feast on her, Granny bravely intervened, wielding a cooking pan and threatening the vampires to protect Maizo. Granny was struck by one of the vampires. As the vampires argued amongst themselves about who would feast first, Su Young arrived on the scene and launched an attack on them. She then instructed the soldiers to head to the beast farm. A new group of vampires emerged from the swarm of bats, but Su Young swiftly defeated them. Just as one of the vampires approached Maizo's group, the wolves arrived and launched a fierce counterattack against the vampires. Su Young and the wolves successfully overpowered the initial group of vampires, but more vampires continued to emerge. Su Young used her defense bomb to eliminate a group of them, only to be surrounded by even more vampires. Just when the situation seemed dire, Suho arrived and swiftly dispatched the vampires surrounding Su Young. He expressed curiosity about the nature of these creatures. Suddenly, Su Young found herself enveloped in a dark fog, and a powerful vampire emerged, grabbing hold of her. Suho questioned the presence of the Vampire Queen and why she was causing chaos in someone else's territory. The Vampire Queen declared that it was now her domain and expressed her desire to avenge her fallen children with Su Young's blood. Suho, unimpressed by her claims, referred to her as another deranged individual. Suho unleashed a powerful attack against the Vampire Queen, but she remained unfazed, only sustaining minor injuries. Determined to defeat her, Suho charged forward, but the Vampire Queen vanished. In response, Suho commanded the Flame Fairy to track her down. Suddenly, an explosion occurred in the distance, causing the Vampire Queen to plummet from the sky. Suho hurriedly rushed to the scene and quickly assessed Su Young's condition, finding relief in her safety. The Vampire Queen observed as her injuries swiftly healed, confirming her strength. Suho acknowledged her resilience, commenting on her determination to survive. In response, the Vampire Queen threatened to harm the captive Su Young if Suho dared to make a move against her. Suho called out her cowardice, questioning why someone as powerful as her would resort to such tactics. She introduced herself as Cheeto's Reguala Balagni's Ravioli Bacala VI, the last princess of the fallen vampire kingdom. Suho dismissed Bacala's introduction, uninterested in her name. Bacala boasted about her invulnerability, claiming that no creature in the universe had ever been able to harm her during the past 10,000 years. Suho remarked on her long life and asked if she was familiar with the animal kingdom planet. 
Bacala admitted her ignorance, to which Suho expressed disappointment. Bacala continued, stating that based on the accounts of her subjects who had visited Earth centuries ago, humans were primitive beings on a planet ruled by them. She believed that humans were incapable of causing any harm to her. Suho responded cryptically, mentioning selective justice as the reason he didn't harm the captive virgin entangled with Bacala. He also mentioned that she was the first individual to survive an attack from his fairies. Suho expressed regret that they couldn't be friends if Bacala hadn't invaded his territory to challenge him. He invited her to stop hiding behind the captive and face him in a fight. Bacala questioned his identity, and Suho confidently introduced himself as Suho Park, the king of the animals. Unfazed, Bacala declared her intent to kill him and claimed the territory as her own. Bacala took control of Suyoung, ordering her to kill Suho and all the creatures in the land. However, Suho noticed that Suyoung regained her consciousness and expressed her defiance towards Bacala's command, questioning the vampire queen's intentions. Suyoung swiftly decapitated Bacala, causing her to fall silent. Suho asked if Suyoung was all right, and she confirmed that she was. Bacala mentioned something about the sword being a god's artifact and expressed her desire to destroy it if she couldn't possess it. Suyoung kicked Bacala's head, but Bacala still managed to summon an attack. As they were dealing with the situation, they noticed a meteor falling towards them. Bacala warned that her enraged warriors would continue to annihilate every living thing on the land until there was nothing left. Suho transformed into a bear and crushed the meteor, then used his tornado to send the debris back into space. Suyoung was surprised by his power, and Bacala recognized it as divine power. Suyoung then destroyed Bacala's head, joking that next time she should start with the vampire's mouth. Suho asked if Suyoung was all right, to which she responded sarcastically. Suho teased her about being a nutcase and not needing medicine. Suyoung got annoyed at his teasing. Suho then expressed his gratitude to Suyoung for saving his family. Suho's team arrived, expressing their relief that Suyoung was safe. Suyoung was surprised to hear that she was captured and asked who had captured her. Suho inquired about the others, and Junho informed him that Granny Sukja and the chief were recovering at the medical center, while Gunwoo had been taken to the dorm. Dongsu alerted everyone that tens of thousands of monsters were approaching their location, and an evacuation order had been issued. Jeshik added that there would be a massive bombing in the area. Junho emphasized the need to escape, which surprised Suho upon hearing the news. Suho sensed the approaching monsters, and Suyoung used her ability to see their location. Suyoung informed everyone that approximately 120,000 monsters were approaching from 6.1 kilometers outside the outer wall of Suho Land Castle. This revelation surprised everyone, and Dongsu suggested retreating. Suho, however, instructed Junho to contact others and warn them not to interfere with his prey. Junho quickly made a call to the army and informed Suho that the artillery bombardment had already started and an air raid would soon follow. Suho transformed into a bird and flew towards the location of the monsters. Despite their initial reluctance, the others followed him, and Dongsu decided to livestream the unfolding situation. The army launched an attack on the horde of monsters, but the air units were met with resistance from monsters capable of launching fireballs. The president was briefed about the situation, and an official reported that despite utilizing all available firepower, the damage inflicted on the monster horde was minimal. One of the officials recommended evacuating Seoul in response. The president adamantly refused the suggestion of evacuating Seoul, emphasizing the significant investment made in the city. However, the officials received news that the United States had approved a nuclear strike, with an aircraft already en route from Guam. This development sparked cheers among the group. The U.S. has approved the use of a 10KT nuclear warhead named Amazing Goodman, set to drop in about an hour and 40 minutes at the old Nakyang Station field. If it explodes at an altitude of 500 meters, it may have a shockwave damage effect up to 4.26 km. The president is concerned about Seoul's safety, but officials assure that the shockwave won't reach the city. However, there are concerns about potential radiation exposure in the long run. The president orders the deployment of the iridium shield on Seoul's outer wall to defend against the approaching monsters. The choppers retreated after incurring losses, but witnessed Suho's arrival to confront the monsters. Suho unleashed his Earth's fury, causing the ground to crumble and bury the horde. However, some monsters managed to dig their way out. Suho summoned vines to dismember the monsters, but they still launched fireballs towards him. Suho summoned the flame fairies, who began to burn the attacking monsters. The president and officials watched in astonishment as Suho displayed his abilities, causing them to question what they were witnessing. 
As they processed the scene before them, they received news that all 120,000 monsters had been successfully eliminated. The president, taken aback by the turn of events, immediately ordered the recall of the nuclear bombers. A few surviving monsters remained, and Jeshik and the rest of the group realized that Suho was motionless, possibly having exhausted himself and fainted. Concerned for his safety, Junho took the lead and attacked the remaining monsters, with the others quickly following suit. Together, they successfully defeated the remaining creatures and ensured Suho's safety. Hiro overheard discussions about a vampire killing people in Dongni district. He saw this as an opportunity, as living as Li Wusing would be advantageous for upgrading the regressor's stone. He anticipated the news of millions of monsters descending from the north and vampires, turning Seoul into a wasteland, which would lead to a mass exodus from the city. Hiro eagerly awaited the unfolding chaos and the chance to upgrade the regressor's stone further. Hiro was taken aback by the news that Suho had single-handedly annihilated the monster horde using earth, fire, and wind elements. He couldn't help but wonder if this was the manifestation of divine power. In that moment, something from his memory resurfaced. It was a man from one of his regressions talking about a rumor of a godlike figure who had appeared in the East, possessing the ability to control elements and exercise evil spirits. This savior was described as having a long scar on his face and was seen as a ray of hope in a desperate world. As Hiro absorbed this information, a man entered the scene and warned Hiro about the approaching vampires. However, before he could finish his sentence, the man was swiftly killed by a vampire. Hiro contemplated the possibility of the rumor being true but remained skeptical. He acknowledged that a scar on someone's face didn't guarantee they possessed divine power, as there could be multiple individuals with such abilities. However, he also speculated that there might be an item capable of awakening divine power, sparking his curiosity and prompting further investigation. Hiro recalled the information shared by Akiko about the rare item. It was said to appear once every thousand years on a planet and vanish within ten days. This extraordinary item had the power to prevent aging and grant immortality when consumed. Hiro realized that the Chakian sword could potentially be the item capable of awakening divine power. Hiro seethed with anger as he remembered his previous defeat at the hands of Suho. He couldn't accept that someone he deemed insignificant had awakened divine power with the help of an item. But then, a realization struck him. If he could go back to the pivotal moment and form an alliance with Suho, he might gain access to the coveted red sky fruit. The solution, he realized, lay in regression, the key to altering the course of events. In Okinawa, Ishigaki Island, Defense Minister Ikeda and Defense Minister Takeo Chanu discussed the recent events. They learned that the U.S. Pacific Fleet had been wiped out by sea monsters while attempting to rescue the South American escape team. They speculated on the monster's increased power and the implications of the U.S. being trapped on the mainland. They also expressed concern over the difficulty in contacting Suho Park, a man with immense power. In their conversation, the idea of consuming Korea was mentioned, raising questions about its feasibility. Akita expressed his disappointment in the Korean government, stating that they have lost their effectiveness in defending Seoul against the relentless monster attacks. He mentioned that cities like Busan, Digu, Gwangyu, and Jeju would likely seek a stronger government and defense contract, potentially declaring independence and signing a defense treaty with Japan. He specifically mentioned Sun Jongmu, the mayor of Busan, who had even visited Yasukuni Shrine in the past. Defense Minister Takeo expressed surprise and acknowledged that there were great individuals in Korea as well. Akita revealed that Gucheon dungeons would soon open in Busan and Ixin. Takeo expressed surprise and questioned the need for such expansion, especially considering the challenges they already face with the Mammon tribe. Akita explained that the people of Gucheon Planet's Central Plains are interested in Korea's traditional sword-making techniques, but Takeo mentioned that Namgung Se, a Korean, was renowned as a swordmaster. Despite this, Akita believed that once the central people of Gucheon and Japan join forces with Korean cities, the city guardians would have no choice but to sign a defense agreement with Japan. The portal suddenly opened near Akita and Takeo, and Dr. Toddler and Chief Gilbert emerged from it. Akita expressed surprise at their mode of arrival, and Gilbert apologized for startling them. Dr. Toddler revealed that they had invented the portal generator, which could currently only accommodate two people at a time. Takeo acknowledged their achievement and expressed gratitude for their support as strategic partners of the Arukas. Gilbert mentioned that the support from the Japanese government played a significant role in making their invention possible. Takeda expressed the need to step up for the greater good of humanity and the New World Order. Toddler mentioned that he had plenty of interesting information to share, including details about Suho Park, 
the Reversion Stone, new weapons for clearing level 7 dungeons, and more. In Suho Land, the group discussed their current situation. Dongsu expressed his frustration with the low drop rate of the Bloodstones from the Giants, reminiscing about the more profitable Scorpion dungeon. Jeshik agreed, acknowledging the time-consuming process of collecting the Bloodstones. Myungjin complained of back pain from the strenuous work. Junho reminded them that they had no choice but to collect the Bloodstones to replenish their guild's treasury, as their funds had been drained due to unexpected construction costs. He mentioned the limited support they were receiving from the government and the financial struggles of their partner, DGB, after downsizing. Dongsu mentioned the surplus of the granary in the Myangyu and questioned why they hadn't made a profit from selling it. Jeshik explained that given the impending global crisis, it would be unlikely for any country to pay for it and they might even have to give it away for free. Junho emphasized the need to work hard and collect the bloodstones. He also asked Dongsu to edit their videos to make him appear less cheesy, expressing concern about his image. Dongsu defended the popular Roaring Slaughterer persona, but Junho expressed his emotional struggles and the tears he had endured over the years. Dongsu reminded Myungjin about his frequent wanderings and discovered that he was responsible for the absence of necrobills. Myungjin explained that he had been saving lost souls during his journeys. As they heard more monsters approaching, they decided to end their activities for the day. Granny Sukja was in the process of recovering. Suyoung and Maizo discussed her slow healing, suspecting that she might be emotionally distressed. Maizo then inquired about Suho Park's whereabouts, to which Suyoung replied that he was likely with his guild members, clearing the field in front of the barricade. Suho arrived, and Maizo informed him about an official letter from the government that she wanted to share with him. Suho questioned the contents of the letter, curious about its subject matter. Maizo handed Suho the guild's zero defense contract, explaining that signing it would elevate Suho guild's level to zero and upgrade Suho land from District 13 to Suho City. She further explained that in the current state of Korea, which consists of united cities with autonomy, Suho City would join the ranks of Seoul, Busan, Gwangju, Digu, and Jeju province. Suho, still puzzled, questioned the significance of this change. Maizo clarified that Suho City would have the same level of autonomy as other large cities and sign an official mutual defense treaty with the Korean government. Suho was intrigued by the idea of a mutual defense treaty. Suyoung explained that it meant the government wanted him to stay within the country and focus on defending Korea. Suho reassured them that he had no plans to leave. Maizo added that the government was concerned about the lack of internal defense when Suho was not in Korea. Suyoung questioned whether Suho was comfortable being constantly pulled in different directions by those who needed his help. Suho expressed his primary goal of ensuring the safety of his home. Maizo assured Suho that he would be well compensated for his support. She emphasized the importance of Suho City receiving backing from the government, acknowledging that mutual assistance between neighbors was crucial. Maizo proposed to Suho that he should hire her, highlighting her ambition and ability to attract top-tier talents for Suho City. Suho expressed interest in the idea, and Maizo promised to submit a job application. Meanwhile, Suyoung was informed that she had been assigned to the Special Task Force for Vampires. Suyoung expressed surprise at the news of a Special Task Force for Vampires, she thought they had already been dealt with. Maizo explained that reports of vampire-related murders were still coming in, necessitating an expansion of the task force and equipment. Suyoung reluctantly accepted the assignment, relieved to hear that she wouldn't be sent to a distant location and deciding to rest for the night before joining the task force the next day. Suho offered her an additional day off, but she declined. Suyoung walked away, and Suho observed her with concern, realizing that she was unwell. Suyoung, reflecting on her condition, wondered if she had caught a cold and felt embarrassed about being a returnee with a cold. It was then shown that she had a vampire bite on her neck. The defense minister was kidnapped by a vampire, and the agents discovered that silver bullets were ineffective against them. However, Suyoung appeared and swiftly defeated the vampire. Reports of government officials being targeted by vampires spread. The British started distributing Arukamite silver bullets to their allied countries. In other news, Hachin Jian, the son of DGB Group, was arrested on charges of corruption. The director pleaded with Maizo not to leave at such a critical moment. He believed she would be the next director and wondered why she would abandon such a golden opportunity. Maizo revealed her decision to go to Suho City, surprising the director. Maizo was contacted by Mr. Chien and discussed the ongoing issues within the group. Mr. Chien mentioned the recent arrest and the concerns regarding the use of defective materials in Suho City. 
Mizo humorously suggested that it was an excuse to remove Mr. Jian from the group. Mr. Chien informed Mizo about the power plant facilities issues and the limited technological solutions available. He suggested reaching out to Tesla in America for faster assistance. Mizo inquired about the involvement of the Shilla Group in building the Bloodstone power plant facilities in Seoul. The secretary confirmed that while the Shilla Group was initially involved, the facilities team from Tesla oversaw the overall construction. Mizo mentioned the technical cooperation with Tesla and the costly patent fee paid for a limited time frame without technology transfer. Mizo also asked about Dr. Richard, who was still the team leader of the facility team in Tesla. Mizo contemplated the need for technological independence in Suho City. Recognizing the importance of dimensional energy research, Mizo realized that they required a skilled engineer similar to Dr. Toddler from British Roland or Dr. Richard from American Tesla. This would involve acquiring the necessary equipment and assembling a team of engineers and researchers. Mizo received the list of returnees from the RCD database, and to her surprise, Sunpil Jiang's name was among them. Suho approached the workers to inquire about the slow progress of the construction. They explained that the machines kept stopping due to frequent electricity outages caused by unstable equipment in the Bloodstone power plant facility. Suho instructed everyone to step back and used his power to clear the rocks, despite feeling exhausted. He told the worker to calculate the distance and deducting the corresponding amount from the construction cost. Junho expressed concern about Suho overexerting himself, but Suho remained determined to reinforce the security of the outer perimeter and eventually travel to the planet Aruka to seek answers to his questions. Maizo informed Suho and Junho that they had received a cooperation request from the Shilla Guild. Suho expressed his reluctance, mentioning that he was busy at the moment. Dongsu interrupted their conversation by jumping down and informing Suho about the presence of a crocodile. Suho expressed surprise and asked for its location. Dongsu revealed that the crocodile was found in one of the dungeons within the Shilla Guild's district, and even their ace, Minhyak Kang, was injured by it. Suho acknowledged the strength of the crocodile, considering Minhyak Kang's S rank status. Maizo informed Suho and the others that the dungeon they were needed for was about to break soon. Suho expressed his intention to hurry, but Maizo intervened, revealing that she had already secured assistance from the Shilla group. She had negotiated the use of their engineers and equipment in exchange for their help in clearing the dungeon. The others were impressed by Maizo's quick action. Suho questioned the urgency, to which Maizo explained that the perspective of the dungeon breaking in eight days was from Shilla Guild's point of view considering the 45 other dungeons they had to deal with. Dongsu reassured Suho, stating that it should be an easy task for him. Maizo suggested waiting for further contact from the Shilla group before proceeding. Suho acknowledged Maizo's negotiation skills, and Junho expressed his gratitude for having her on their team. Dongsu jokingly mentioned the need for at least one intelligent member in their guild. The helicopter arrived as an apology from DGB, and Maizo explained that it was sent as compensation. Dongsu recognized the pilot, Minsu Seo, who had previously raided a level 4 dungeon with them in Suho land. Minsu introduced himself as the leader of Suho Guild's portal equipment team, and the others welcomed him to the guild. Maizo informed them that Shilla Guild received the green light, and Suho was eager to get started. Suho instructed the others to start filling the stream with water for his crocodile farm. Minsu assured everyone that he was skilled in flying the helicopter, and they left together, ready for the mission. Junho expressed his concern about Jeshik going to Jianyu to search for Sunpil Jang, the Thousand Sword Smith. Maizo informed Junho that Jeshik had not yet found him. Junho questioned the necessity of going to Jianyu, since they had already made a favorable deal with Shilla Group, and sword craftsmanship seemed unrelated to the Bloodstone power plant. Maizo explained to the others that Sunpil Jang's sword craftsmanship from planet Hades is unique and different from Earth's. She highlighted his exceptional skill in invention, comparable to Dr. Toddler, and suggested that his talents might surpass even Dr. Toddler's. Dongsu speculated that Sunpil Jang could be one of those renowned but elusive masters. Maizo agreed, considering him as a potential research director for Suho City, with the only remaining variable being his availability. Meanwhile, Jeshik was having fun on his trip. Minsu expressed his sadness at the current state of Earth, remarking that it feels like the entire planet is transforming into a massive dungeon. He explained that dungeon monsters are displacing people and creating their own villages, leading to significant changes in the Earth's environment, including agricultural fields in Korea. Suho realized that to truly understand and address this situation, they would need to uncover the root cause of Earth's deterioration. 
Suho pondered the possibility that the high elves of Aruka might hold the key to unraveling the mystery behind the catastrophe that befell Earth, the emergence of dungeons, the fate of his missing friends, and the enigma surrounding his own existence. Suho inquired about the whereabouts of the portal that would transport him to the mysterious planet Aruka. Minsu revealed that the Aruka portal in Asia was situated in Siaguipo, Jeju. He emphasized the classified nature of this information, known only to higher-ranking government officials and RCD technicians, as the public's knowledge could potentially cause chaos. Suho contemplated his next move, realizing that once he had gathered enough crocodiles to populate the new stream, he would set off for Jeju to embark on his journey to Aruka. Hiro overheard a customer recognizing him as Siangu Lee while he was at work. However, the mother dismissed the girl's observation. After finishing his shift, Hiro concluded that it was time for him to leave Busan. He decided that the United States would provide a legal blind spot for him, as there were more independent survivors scattered across the fields. Hiro believed that upgrading his reversion stone would be easier there compared to Korea or Japan. The large cities in the US still had sufficient power and intelligence to withstand 10 years of level 7 dungeon breaks and monster waves. With the intention of accessing their intelligence using his future diary as bait, Hiro planned to obtain more advanced data on Suho Park. Determined, he made up his mind to go to America. Inside the dungeon, Minsu was reluctantly pulled along by Suho, reminding him that his role was only to provide transportation. As they ventured deeper, Suho felt a sense of familiarity. Suddenly, Lizardmen emerged, targeting Minsu. However, Suho swiftly intervened, using his vines to restrain the creatures. He instructed Minsu to eliminate the captured Lizardmen, and Minsu reluctantly followed his command. Meanwhile, Suho dealt with the remaining threats. Suho then directed Minsu to eliminate any other enemies they encountered and collect their bloodstones. Suho noticed a familiar mark on a tree, realizing it belonged to Kuro. Confused, he wondered why Kuro's marking was present in his former territory. He wondered why Kuro had left the marking in his former territory and what might have transpired in the forest during his absence. Suho attempted to use his skill to uncover more information about the events that took place in the forest. He caught glimpses of his fights and witnessed the presence of Kuro and other animals, also the destruction of the area. However, the memories and details remained vague, leaving him frustrated with the limited recollection provided by his skill. Minsu alerted Suho to the presence of an approaching lizard, breaking his train of thought. Like and subscribe if you want me to continue the next chapters and thank you for watching.